August 20th meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals in accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law uh, due to the novel coronavirus. Uh, this public meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals is physically closed uh, to the public in order to avoid group congregation. Uh, there are alternative public access measures in place. The meeting is being televised via FCTV and real time public comment can be addressed to the Zoning Board of Appeals utilizing the Zoom virtual meeting software for remote access. Uh, this application will allow users to view the meeting and also send a comment or question to the chair via the chat fu function. Submitted text comments will be read into the record at the appropriate points uh, in the meeting. Uh, for Zoom login instructions, you can go to www.falmouthmass.us slash ZBA. Uh, and from there, you click the link, and that should get the Zoom software up and running for you. Uh, I'll introduce the board at this time. Uh, my name is TJ Hurry. I'm the chair of the board. Uh, also with us tonight is Ken Foreman, who is the vice chairman, Bob Dugan, who is the clerk. Uh, we have Ed Van Curen will be on his way. Uh, Scott Solinsky, who is a full voting member. Mary Berry, who is an associate member, and James Morse, who is an associate member as well. Uh, Noreen Stockman is our zoning administrator. Ashley DeMello is our recording secretary for the night. Uh, we also have Thomas Cox helping out with the Falmouth IT department and our friends at FCTV as well. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals is charged with applying the zoning bylaws for the town and we consider requests for special permits, variances and appeals as provided in the bylaws which have been approved by town meeting and the Attorney General's Office for the Commonwealth. All the decisions that the board makes are made through the public hearing process. The board's goal is to hear testimony from the applicant and from the public and also to allow a full and fair discussion of the project prior to rendering a decision. To begin each hearing, the clerk will read the public announcement of the hearing and then present any pertinent information from the file, such as referrals from town departments and summarizing correspondences to the board. The applicant or the applicant's representative will then have 15 minutes to make a presentation and time may be extended by vote of the board. Uh, the board will then question the applicant and the public will be invited to comment as well. Uh, public comments should be directed only at the project itself, and we ask you to please refrain from making any personal or derogatory statements. Uh, public con comment can include an opinion in favor or in opposition, or it might just be simply a question about the nature of the project. Uh, all members of the public wishing to speak should utilize uh, the Zoom chat function, and again, uh, that is available at www.falmouthmass.us slash ZBA. Uh, again, there's a link to Zoom. You can click that and uh, log on. Uh, and we do ask you to provide your full name and address for the record. Uh, the board will then either close or continue the hearing when the board is satisfied that enough information has been presented by testimony and in the file to make a decision by motion and vote of the board, the hearing will be closed. And the alternative, we may continue the hearing to a future date and time. After the hearing is closed, no more testimony may be taken. And as for board discussion and decision, the board may then further discuss the project among ourselves and make a motion to deny or approve would be made and voted upon. The motion will include a summary of key findings and conditions. An affirmative vote of four members, which is a supermajority, is required for approvals of motions on special permits, variances, and appeals. A split vote, such as a three to two vote, would be a failure to carry and would result in denial of the project. Under Massachusetts general law, if a special permit is denied, the applicant cannot return to the board for two years unless the project is substantially different. Uh, turning to our agenda for the night, we have public comment. We have three continuations, three new public hearings, and we have a few items on our open meeting uh, agenda. Uh, so first up tonight is public comment. Uh, this public public, I'm sorry, this public comment period is for anything that is not on the agenda. So if anyone out there has anything to comment on something that is not on our agenda tonight, you can go ahead, utilize the Zoom 
uh, chat function, please use your name and address for the record. And if anything comes across, I'll, I'll make that announcement. Uh, we can go to our continuations. And up first, we have Ferreira, which is application 37 2010, Terry Lou Ave in East Falmouth. Can you hear me okay? We can, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. You hear my dog. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we can hear him too. <laughs> uh, do, do you have anyone else with you tonight? My builder, Colin, is here. I believe I see his name down. Oh, okay. Is he? Uh, yeah. If we could elevate him then, please. <laughs> Is he able to? Oh, I, see, I see he's up. He's uh, currently Colin Young? Yes. He's currently muted. So, Colin, if you could unmute yourself, should have you up and running. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. <laughs> So uh, where we le last left off with this project, I think we wanted it to be staked, and you provided uh, updated plans to us. I don't know if you I don't know if you wanted to add anything else in terms of uh, more information from the last hearing. That is what we did. Uh, we did uh, restake it, showing uh, where everything was, or is, or going to be, uh, and uh, we were also asked to clarify. Uh, the uh, there's a kind of a catwalk um, it's depicted on the original plans as uh, uh, open to below is what it says. So we took some pictures, submitted those and uh, put in the measurements and uh, kind of said what it was on a plan. Um, so that should be there. Um, it's basically just storage. And <clears throat> Uh, that was those were the two things we were asked for other than that. All right, I, I'll see if the board has any questions. Uh, Bob, before we start, can you just confirm who the voting members are on this? Because I don't have that. My apologies. Yeah, so the voting members on this are um, TJ Harry, Ken Foreman, Robert Dugan, Ed Ben Curran, and Scott Zielinski. So all the regular members. All right, so all the voting members it is. All right, uh, board questions. Bob, do you have anything? No, I, my only question, Colin, is on the, on the new drawing that you set up, um, I can see where the stairway goes to the loft. Where that other stairway goes to the second floor, does that loft continue all the way to that stairway? It seems like there's an empty space. I just wonder what that empty space was. Uh, well, there's a, there, there's a small space, about four by five on one side. Uh, and then on the other side, it's I think about six by five, I believe on the other side, it's a little bit bigger. Um, and then there's the like four foot catwalk that goes across there. Um, it's really not space that can be used for anything other than storage. Uh, as you can see from the pictures, that's exactly what it is used for. Um, I'm not sure why it was put up there. I guess it was, uh, you know, intended to be uh, an attic, but they wanted to have, they wanted to have storage, but still, um, you know, have the space to to have a vaulted ceiling. Uh, so I think that was the original plan. That's my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Ken, anything? No, I don't have any questions. All right. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Ed, any questions? We got you muted, Ed. Is that okay, okay now? We can hear you. Okay, I have no questions. I looked right. at the pictures. It's okay. Thank you, Ed. Scott, anything? 
No, sir, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's anyone out there who has any public comment, question, or a concern hey, about uh, the project. Mr. Chairman, I, yep. I'm sorry. Um, could you uh, have the applicant confirm the bedroom count for that house, just for the record? Sure. If either, I guess, Colin, if you could confirm that for us. I believe there's uh, four bedrooms. Uh, Maria is still on. I believe she can. Yep, that's correct. We have four bedrooms and a septic to accommodate four. And that that's with the the in law apartment or the, the that that's a total. That includes my living quarters too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and again, if anyone out there has any question, comment, concern regarding this project, go ahead and use the webinar chat, use your full name and address for the record, and uh, we can get the issue uh, announced and uh, possibly answered. And my apologies, I had something in my notes here about a deed restriction. Is that currently in place on the property? That was provided. Yes, it's there. You can have it in your files. I talked to Ashley today to make sure she had everything. Thank you. Does the board have any follow-up questions? None here. All right. I think the board's heard everything. Uh, would anyone like to close the hearing? Actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have one question. Uh, sure. On the assessor's records, it shows that it's a three-bedroom house. And I know the applicant said it was a four. The new addition made it a three. In, in 2009, the addition was for four total bedrooms. Wouldn't that reflect on the assessor's card now, Mr. Chairman? I think that it should. By now, right? I, I would think it would have to be updated, Scott. Bob, you're reading three. You're reading three in the. File? Yeah, it's 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 three in the thing. I am looking over the. Um, there was a covenant deed restriction. Um, from two thousand eight, and that was for an approval of an addition to the dwelling on the premises. Um, where the addition was converted to a master suite. Uh, also listed that the master sheet suite could only be used by persons related to the owner, meaning individually or collectively, uh, by marriage, blood, or adoption of a domestic partner of the owner, including minor children in the care of any of them, or by guests of the owner's family itself. So that, that's still in place. Um, if we approve this this evening, uh, it would probably be safer to have the administrator draft an approval because there are prior decisions on the property as well as the deed restriction, um, just to make sure we have everything covered in the conditions and then we could actually do a final vote at the next meeting. It's probably a good idea, Bob. This is uh, just to, to go back, the, the, the addition that we're talking about is the one from 2009, not the one that we're talking about now. Yeah, that's that's correct. The deed the deed restriction was on the two thousand nine, um, but as that and based on septic, the any addition that you do now, we couldn't have anything that could be considered an additional bedroom. It's not. It's not considered a bedroom. It's a den and a place where I can do work. I work from home. And it is a uh, the mother and the daughter. Um, they share the living space, so they are related. It shows that clearly in the plan. It's a case to opening. There's no door. Yeah, but Scott asked us to do that. We changed it to make sure that that was right. I'm shown. just saying that right away makes it not a bedroom. And that what is is there anything, uh, Bob, in the Board of Health? I, I looked at the referral. There's no information in the referral that I can see. Uh, that says it's four bedroom, or the septic is approved as four bedroom. Yeah, I actually don't see an actual bedroom count. There was originally um, an issue with the board of health where he was concerned about the addition that it, 
not meet any definition and they did make that opening change so that wouldn't be adding an additional bedroom, but it doesn't actually say what the bedroom count is. Okay, so I guess they looked at it and decided, except for the fact that that couldn't be an additional bedroom, the current bedroom count was okay. Correct. I just don't know if they were basing it on the assessor's records. Um, it appears that sometimes the health department bases on assessor's records. The assessor's records, for some reason, haven't caught up and still listed as a three. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the board of health uses assessor's records, do they? Well, I think, I don't they, think I, yeah, I think the board of health will typically look at whatever plans we scan in <clears throat> review. But the other thing that you could do with your decision would be to uh, provide that the assessor do a walkthrough uh, before the final building sign off and they can verify the number of bedrooms for their count. And we're completely fine with that. And that's all what we say it is. Thank you for that. So. Uh, it's a pretty modest project as before us, but I think it's uh, it gets a little complicated with the the deed restriction in the past uh, past decisions that are on file. So I'd be in favor of closing the hearing and uh, All right. So I'm going to move that we close the hearing. I'll second Ken's motion. I'll second it. All right. So Ken to close and seconded by. I'll give that to Ed. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Bob. Robert Dugan, I. Ken. Ken Foreman, I. Uh, Ed. Ed Van Curen, I. Scott. Scott Zalinski, I. And TJ Hurry, I. So the hearing is closed. And how would the board like to proceed? So I'd make a motion that the administrator uh, drop a, pro a positive approval um, that we could vote on at the next meeting a draft. And that would have to incorporate prior decisions deed restriction, um, all the referrals from the health department. Assessors walkthrough. Assessors walkthrough. Uh, 240- uh, it does meet 240-3C and it meets 240-216. You know, normally it would be a little easier decision, but there was, like you said, a past issue where it wasn't in compliance and then that's when that deed restriction was added. Um, so I think it's a good idea to put the, um, the assessor's walkthrough on. Okay, I'll second that if you need a second. All right. Anything right. else to guide Noreen at the moment, or do we think that's... Uh, that's well, nice? I guess just for, so just for findings, 240-3C, 240-216, um, I think we should probably notate that it's a modest addition. Uh, we should notate the, um, the prior... Uh, the prior decision, the deed restriction, and also the prior issues that, that uh, required the deed restriction. Um, as far as conditions, we could go per plans, um, subject properties to be used only as a single family residence. Um, again, add the condition that the um, assessor's department will be doing a walkthrough prior to occupancy to confirm the bedroom count and any other changes in setup. Uh, condition on all the uh, requirements uh, from engineers department, including drywalls, the runoff. Um, I'd also like to just, uh, when she does the decision, just check one item. In one of the previous decisions, I think one of the setback nonconformities was mislabeled um, to the wrong side of the house. So if you could just check that. As a finding, this the addition does not make any of the nonconformities worse. All right. Anything else? All right. So that was a motion by Bob directing Noreen to draft a positive uh, approval, and that was seconded by Ken. Do that would call. be for September third. September 3rd. Thank you, Noreen. We'll do a roll call vote again. Bob? Robert Dugan, I. Ken? Ken Foreman, I. Ed? Ed Van Curen, I. Scott? Watson, I. 
and TJ Hurry I. So thank you for your time tonight. Noreen will draft the positive approval and we will vote on it during our next meeting, September 3rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay, up next we have the continuation of application 27-2797 Main Street LLC. 797 Main Street in Falmouth. Mr. Chuba, how are you tonight? Good, how are you, Mr. Chair? Doing well. Good. I For me to speak, or uh... oh, we we lost your audio a little bit. I saw that I saw that you were speaking, but uh, if you could start over again, my apologies. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, good evening, and and, and uh, I'm here representing the uh, 797 Main Street LLC. I did submit a request to continue this hearing. Uh, the reason for that is uh, since our last meeting, we did engage uh, uh, Attorney Ament to help us with the legal. Uh, uh, issues with the with the uh with the project uh you and in in particular the uh cycle avenue uh, uh parking and the uh, the uh the agreement that was uh uh drawn between my client and adjacent uh, uh properties so at this time i believe we there's still some issues or uh there's other parties involved, and I think uh, Mr. Dugan, you might be right. I think there's some still interest to that uh, property with the uh, with the uh, access to the rear for uh, uh, the uh, Island Queen parking lot. And I did revise the plans to eliminate a couple of parking spaces in the back. To sh and and m attorney. Uh, uh, Terry is working, still working with uh, with the with all the parties in in order to come up to an agreement. So that's the reason for mainly the reason for our in the, the our request to continue. Also, meanwhile, I tried to reach out to the build, to the engineering uh, to to address their comments, and I thought I spoke with Scott, and we did come to an agreement. But I guess I was. Uh, uh, there's some misunderstanding and I'm not sure what happened. I did change the plans. I sent it back and they came back and they said they still have some, some uh, comments that it's not resolved. And they, I believe they, they asked the board if we can engage a peer review for this project. Uh, again, it's up to the board. I think, you know, if this project in no means this project, it's a, it's a less than a quarter of an acre. It's a small parking lot with a couple of cash spaces. I, but again, if we're not coming to an agreement with, with engineering and if the board feels strongly that we need to get a peer review, I think my client wouldn't be opposed. I don't think there's a need for it, but again, I'm not going there, and, you know. But um, I did mention to Noreen, rather than address the engineering comments at this time, I'd rather wait till to see what happens with the with the legal issues. If my clients cannot execute that agreement that was drawn between him and, and, the, and the adjacent properties, this will change the, the concept of this whole project. You know, We might be looking at leaving the, the place the way it is and not doing anything. We might have to withdraw our application or come back Mr. Chu, are you there? Looks like he froze up, at least on my screen. I'm not sure about anyone else. Yeah, he froze up on mine. Okay. Could we maybe have some board discussion until he reconnects? I think it'd be all for postponing it until they decide to get the legal issues squared away. 
So I, so I, I, I understand the situation with the, um, with the legal issues. Um, I don't think we should discuss this if he's not. Yeah, if we, if we could hold, hold for him to get queued back up here, if you can join us again. Mr. Chuba. Yes, I, I think uh, we. I'm. We lost you. We lost your audio again. We we yeah. have your video, but we just lost your audio. Uh, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, I apologize. I think it might be my end. I'm not sure, but uh, anyways, uh, uh, we're uh, we kindly ask for con to continue this hearing and most likely to the second portion of September or you know so. That's that's where we stand now. All right, thank you. And uh, I think it might warrant some board discussion about the issue prior to doing any possible vote. Okay. Bob, did you want to start us off? Uh, well, just two things. So I, so I guess we have two issues here. We have one issue where the um, applicant needs to have their legal counsel answer the questions that we asked last time with town counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, the second issue would be regarding engineering. Um, the last email that we got from our engineering department regarding referrals on the current information that they had on the site um, stated the applicant's engineer did not resolve the site issues. It says engineering has reviewed these draft plans and there are still issues, some which have been pointed out in various reviews of the ZBA and planning. Some of them are new. This is resulting um, from the current revisions. And due to the time spent and the number of times reviewing these plans by multiple engineering staff, with some of the same issues not being adequately addressed, at this point, we cannot continue reviewing these plans. So that's coming from the engineering department, and that's why engineering is saying that we do need peer review. They will not work on this project further because they just don't have the time. I know Mr. Chuba said that his applicant um, may be willing to do that. Um, there was an email that went out from the administrator um, explaining this and this states it says please see the reply below by town engineer which I just read it says in order for the application to move forward on August 20th we will need to arrange for an outside peer engineer to review the plans and there will need to be a consensus on resolution to outstanding issues approval by the peer engineer and approval by Falmouth's engineer in order for the board to consider approval on the engineering aspect of the plans the town engineers have suggested that to gain a peer engineering review, they will need to request a check of $5,000 payable to the town to arrange and secure a peer engineer for review. Um, and then it asked to please reply to this email as to whether the applicant is willing to fund the engineering review and then follow that affirmative reply, they would set it up. Um, and it may not be possible to review engineering portion at the meeting, which is tonight. And again, we don't have time um, I don't know, and I'll ask Laureen, um, did we get a response on that, accepting peer review? So I think so I Mr. Mr. Ch uh, Chuba just addressed that, where he suggested that he would like to see if they can get a resolution to the legal issues, but that he didn't feel that his client was inclined to pay for the peer review at this time. So that makes sense, right? Wait until you know if yes. you have the rights before you spend a lot of money re-engineering it. I agree. So I, why don't we grant him the continuation for now? Uh, Noreen, what's the, with that. He, he asked to go into the latter half of September. I'm not sure what the dates are. Uh, we've been looking at the calendar and if, given the schedule, we're either between September 24th or October 1st. Um, it might be preferable to the board, albeit it's up to you, that you continue to October 1st. I'll make a motion. Scott, j just before you make that motion, do and this might not be an actual part of the motion itself, but 
if it comes back, if the legal representation comes back and says that the outstanding issues with that, they could proceed with the project, would the board itself be expecting uh, them to retain uh, peer review for the engineering? I just want to get that on the table. That so everyone, part of my motion. everyone expects it. Okay. Go ahead, Scott, if you have a, if you have a motion. So I make a motion to uh, grant um, the continuation while they, um, while they discuss and go over the legal issues and with the caveat that if that comes back positively, that they pay for their peer review. I mean, their um, engineering peer review. And continue to October 1. Yeah, yes, sir. I'll second. All right, so I think it was October 3rd. Sorry, I said October 1st. First. So, yes, October 1st. The oh. third, this is Saturday. Oh, okay. All right, so motion was made by Scott. Was there a second? A second. Seconded by uh, Bob. Roll call vote, Bob. Robert Dugan, aye. Ken. Ken Foreman, aye. Ed. Ed Van Curen, aye. Scott. Scott Zelensky, aye. And TJ Hurry, aye. Mr. Shuba, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Okay, up next we have the continuation of application 36-20, Wings Pond LLC, 63 North Falmouth Highway in North Falmouth. Do we have Mr. Maroney with us? Mr. Maroney. Hi. Hello. Uh, so just to catch everyone up, uh, we did have a site visit this past Sunday. It was August 15th. Uh, it was cut short uh, due to the board having some technical questions about the project. Uh, there wasn't anyone like a surveyor or an engineer on site with you. So I think we were going to reschedule that. Uh, but I just wanted to get that out of the way first. Yes, correct. And we'd be looking to reschedule at some point uh, with the appropriate people uh, to review the project on site again. Yes, who, who do you want there? Who, who do you consider to be the appropriate people? The surveyor? Or? So the, the most appropriate would be everyone in your design team, if that's possible, but you'd have to have a surveyor, you'd have to have your engineer. Um, if you have an environmental person, somebody for environmental. Um, somebody that can actually answer the questions so that when the board has questions at site, we can get the answers there versus going to have to um, go back again. I know that, you know, on the site visit that we had that we actually um, ended abruptly, um, you were the only one that actually attended for the applicant. Um, and that was our big issue. When you have technical questions and you need to know about engineering and stakes and environmental and walk the site, um, you know, you have familiarity with the plans, but you just aren't able to answer the technical questions that we need at the time. So they should all be there. And actually our peer review should actually be there also. I, I just like this say for the record though, this is the first time uh, in three uh, projects like this that even I was invited to the site walk. It was just stake it out and you would look at it on your own. So I was a little taken I was a little confused by that, but I understand now um, whoever you'd like to have there, we'll have that. And um, you just let us know when. I can try and get as many people in that group there as possible. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Maroney. Uh, I'd, like I add, I'd like to add, I, I did not go with you guys, but I did go two days ago. Uh, and I think that... Uh, it's a little different because they're proposing than these other projects that Mr. Mirio is referring to because they're proposing to build inside the wetland buffer. So I'm sure there are technical issues that come up with respect to that. Thank you, Ken. 
And Mr. Maroney, I don't know if you had anything uh, separately to go over tonight or if you just wanted to lead off with board questions. Um, no, I actually, uh, I was gonna ask uh, to, con to continue to schedule the site walk. And there are some other things that we are working on that came up at the last meeting that are well along the way but not complete yet. Such as, you know, we did the 21E, but we don't have a report yet. We got a verbal that we had a clean bill of health. And we didn't come up. I know the monitoring levels have shown, have shown on the revised plans. And not monitoring levels, all the test locations will be shown on the revised plans. So we don't have a written report in hand. So I'm sure that'll be helpful for the board to review that prior to the site walk. And so if that makes sense to you, I'd like to schedule a site walk for certainly not next weekend, which is Labor Day weekend. I'm sure everybody has something else to do. So possibly the following Saturday, the 12th. And maybe continue this hearing until sometime after that, either right here, the 24th or the 1st. So Mr. Marioni, would you want to confirm with your design team first for the actual date so that we know um, that they're all available for that date? Or are you actually saying that you will make sure they are all available? Well, I don't know that I can say that, uh, Mr. Dubin, but that I can make sure that they're available. I would certainly have to check with them, but I think that would give me enough time to, uh, in fact, to know, you know, if one couldn't make it, I could find out as early as tomorrow or Monday. And if somebody couldn't make it, then I'd ask to change the date. But the, I'd, I'd like to be able to give them a date that you think works for you. I did have a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman, if we get to the question portion just regarding our our short visit there on Saturday. Sure, and uh, just before you do that, Bob, I'll, I will say if uh, anyone out there has a question, comment, concern regarding this project, just type it into the webinar chat and uh, we will bring it up uh, when the time comes. But Bob, if you had a few questions, go right ahead. So just a couple, so Mr. Marioni, originally on that site, when the department heads did their site visit, there was a building structure that was on site. And I know we discussed this last time that when I did my, my first site visit when they were doing, when you had applied, um, I went to the location of that structure and the structure had been demolished, but there was you know, tons of cement material that were still there, um, a lot of piles in what appeared to be um, maybe oil staining or whatever on the cement. I noticed that when we went there this week that all of that rubble has been removed from the property. So, um, so what I would like to know is, uh, was there a demolition permit? Was there a hauling permit? Who actually did the work in removing the, the all that uh, material from the site um, since the current applicant has had site control since last year? Um, first, the, the building was taken down for safety reasons. It was, we did not pull a permit to take the building down. It was falling down, we found evidence of Possibly, you know, we'll say teenagers, but whatever. No, there was somebody that had been in there. There were broken alcohol bottles in the building. People had been using it. There was evidence that they were lighting fires to stay warm or whatever. And the building was unsafe, so we took it down while we were doing test fits out there. So at, our, our, so at our last hearing, when you asked that question, you said you didn't know what happened to the building. It was just gone. So. When did you come up with this information? Is it something you out about? I, I don't remember saying I didn't know what happened. To it. I knew what happened. To it. Well, at the last, well, just you know, you can review it. But at the, yeah. at, at the last meeting, you didn't know what had happened. So, so since that was taken down for safety reasons, um, since that time, all the rest of the rubble was removed. Did you get a permit for that? Uh, we don't need a permit to clean up rubble, do we? Well, you didn't get a permit I don't think to. So. To remove the building and you didn't inform the building did you well maybe you did did you inform the building department there was a safety issue on the site no i guess my only other question was when we were at the site visit you mentioned that there were plans to use thirty-five thousand pounds of fill on this site and you mentioned that the fill that you were planning on putting here was going to be coming from another project um, further down in north falmouth um, 
Do you have any kind of earth moving permit or anything regarding that on the fill that you'll be bringing from another site here? Not currently. I may have further questions regarding any kind of compliance with the earth moving bylaw. So at, at our next meeting, you may want to have that information available. Was that a question to me? I'm sorry. Mr. Durbin, was that a question I'm, to me? No, i just, it's a comment that, you know, we do have bylaws regarding earth moving and fill. So uh, we'd want to see what the compliance is for those. And again, on the fill, I, I, I don't know if I said 3,500, but it's 35,000 pounds of fill plus that you said that you yeah. were planning to move from the other site. We, what I, I think to clarify, it's 35,000 yards. And we need 35,000 yards on this site. And we actually have 35 to 40,000 extra yards uh, at 13 North Thomas Highway. And, uh, when the time comes to move that material, we would have to do it appropriately. Any other questions, Bob? We're in the no, that's it for now. Just, um, I guess, you know, there was mentioned tonight of a 21E. So when we see that, I'd like to actually see the locations of the test pits. Um, for the 21E, since uh, when we're walking on site, it seems like most of the uh, material that's coming out of the ground um, seems to be over vast areas of the site. So I just want to see the information on the 21E when the test pits were done. Um, I do believe we should have some kind of information regarding um, the demolition and removal that's happened so far. Um, you know, if they've said tonight they did not get permits for it. Um, if there's safety issues in a building and someone's worried about safety issues, it's a single call of a building department to let you know this is an emergency situation. We have to take care of it. Um, that building was demolished sometime last year. That rubble was there when I did my original site visit. So it didn't seem like there was a strong safety concern at that point. Or they, I would assume they would have removed that earlier. Um, I was very stunned that all that material has been removed. Um, again, without any kind of a notice um, on the site. Uh, you know, you worry about something like this where it has a, you know, wetland habitat near it. Um, if they're not following, you know, preparation issues, control issues, um, you need to know where that, where that material was. That material could have been hazardous. You need to know where, you know, who's hauling it. Um, all that information should be public and should be available. And it's very disconcerting when you show up and, you know, at one meeting is, I don't know what happened with the building. At the next meeting is, oh yeah, we did it for safety reasons. And now we hold, the, you know, we haul the rest of the items out, but there's no explanation. Um, as far as the staking of the property, we can go over that later. Um, there was at least one stake that was down and I know Mr. Marioni had put it back up. I just wanna make sure that if any of the stakes have, have changed over time, that, um, that they uh, make sure that those are in the actually correct spot that has to do with the plans. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Ken, any questions? I just was wondering that what's the total length of that road? Just a little under 800 feet. 800? Yeah, it's about 785 feet. Did we get any kind of comment from uh, public safety regarding access turnaround? So the so town engineer did do uh, a brief review, um, but then they passed on the bulk of that review to the peer engineer. So we're awaiting that feedback, I guess. There was original feedback about a concern that there was insufficient area provided for turning. 
but I would have to double check on that. Yeah, well, looking at the plan and having walked around out there, that certainly was my impression. Ed, any questions? Not at this time. Scott, anything? Oh, you're on mute, Scott. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, I, I know that I'd be interested in the future when we uh, nail down the the 35,000 yards of material coming back, being that it's going into a spot that uh, that has so many environmental restrictions on it and variances requested that there to be some testing on all of that. I'd like to remind the... Uh, the applicant's representative that just because you tear a building down, that rubble that gets torn down is still part of that demolition and needs to be, it needs to be accounted for. And that's what we're looking for. That's all. All we're looking for is accountability, Mr. Maroney. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Uh, Mr. Maroney, when we were on that site visit, uh, you pointed out the easement and I believe you said that you intended to abandon the easement prior to construction? No. Uh, what, no exact, what exactly is the plan? The plan is to use the easement until our roadway is to the point of binder, our travel is to the point of binder. And then we don't plan to use it anymore. We plan to landscape between us and them and not use it as our access. Um, Mr. Maroney, my apologies, because at least on my end, the uh, the audio came in a little scrambled. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, sir. The, the intention is to keep the easement for our use until we get the road cut in, the base code in, and the binder paper down. Then once we can use access on our own property, we will then not use that easement anymore and our intention is to landscape between it so that it can't be accessed off of that and give some privacy to the neighbor. All right, thank you for that. Uh, any other follow-up questions from the board? Not here. Um, I do have a question regarding that easement now that you bring it up. So I know that you had staked out the property. Can you stake out the width of the easement so that when we're there, we know the portion of the easement that you're gonna just be using? as a construction entrance. And I just wanna make sure, and I'll just bring this up once, it seems that we get differing information from hearing the hearing. I just wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page with the information. Um, you know, Mr. Hurry said that um, there was a mention that you wouldn't be using the easement and that was my recollection from the, from the meeting on Saturday. So um, whether you use it or not, you know, maybe you could just send us something that says, this is our plans for the easement. So we just have something to put in the file and then we don't have to worry about any kind of a back and forth or any kind of misunderstanding. Well then maybe I should just backpedal a little bit and say, we fully intend to use it as we have, we have every right to use it until we don't feel like using it anymore because we're using our own roadway. Okay, so Mr. Maroney, so you just so just so I'm clear because you just stated you were now going to use it until the construction was done, and now a few minutes later you just said that well actually we'll just use it for as long as we ever want to use it. So so which way is it? Is it till the construction is done, or are you just going to keep it as an easement um, to use over time? It is your right. We just need to know what the plans are so that we go with one thing and we don't keep going with this back and forth. It's, it's too confusing. It's not fair to you or the, you either or the applicant because we have to rely on our decision on the information that we're given. And if we're given one bit of information and then we're given the opposite, we don't know which way to go. Well, then I'll, I'll have to say that it's too early for me to answer that question until I see how things are going. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions from the board at this time? No. All right, seeing none. Uh, Mr. Maroney, you said that you were gonna check with your team and check on your avail availability dates for another site visit? Well, yeah, there's the 12th Saturday, the 12th work for the board. 
if it does, I'll see if the team can be, if we can get the whole team out there. I don't know if I can com commit to that this very minute, but I can definitely check to see. Yeah, that's that's why, uh, well, Mr. I'll Chairman, I, I think we need to, and he may not be able to give that information tonight because he does have to check with, you know, that his representatives, um, if he can't give that tonight and then we can find out, we can always post that in advance. Um, the one concern I have on Saturdays is just due to my work schedule. I did clear my work schedule last week. I know that Scott did also. So whatever date is finally picked, I just want to make sure that everyone's available for that date because it's too hard to change our work schedules. Um, so, you know, we don't have to lock a date down tonight. He can contact the administrator once he checks with his people and then we can check with our peer review and then she can notify all the um, board members so that we're aware that that will be the, um, the final date. Sounds good. Why don't we do that then? Okay. All right, and as for a continuation for this public hearing, uh, Noreen, I'll defer to you again. So I think at this point in time, October 1st probably makes best sense. Very good. Would anyone like to make that motion? So a motion to continue to October 1st. Second. All right, motion to continue to October 1st. That was made by Bob and seconded by Ed. We'll do a roll call vote. Bob? Robert Dugan, aye. Ken? Ken Foreman, aye. Uh, Ed? Ed Van Curen, aye. Scott? Oh, you're muted, Scott, sorry. Scott Zielinski, aye. And TJ Hurry, aye. So this hearing is continued to October 1st. Mr. Maroney, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. All right, moving along to our public hearings. We have application 43-20 Brown, 159 Uplong Road in East Falmouth. So application number 43-20, being all persons deemed affected by the Board of Appeals under section 11 of chapter 48 of the Mass General Laws, you are hereby notified that Fenton Brown of Westboro, Mass has applied to the Board of Appeals for a special permit pursuant to sections 240-68A8 of the Code of Falmouth to relocate existing garage and construct a pool within the front yard more than 50 feet from the front property line on subject property known as 159 Up Along Road, East Falmouth, Mass. For referrals. Uh, from Falmouth uh, Conservation Commission. These are their comments for 159 Up Along Road, which is application 4320. Current comments are based on the preliminary development plans prepared for 159 Up Along Road for Fenton and Melody Brown by BSS Design, Inc., dated 617 2020. The proposal is to relocate an existing garage and to construct a pool within the front yard. The wetland resource areas on this property include salt marsh, coastal bank land under salt pond and land subject to coastal storm flowage. The conservation department's comments are as follows. One, salt marsh. The current plan shows the relocation of the existing garage from its current location within the buffer zone to a salt marsh to an area of upland outside of conservation jurisdiction under 310 CMR 10.325. A proposed project in a salt marsh on lands within 100 feet of a salt marsh or in a body of water adjacent to a salt marsh shall not destroy any portion of the salt marsh and shall, have, and shall not have any adverse effect on the productivity of the salt marsh. The limit of work LOW line must be established in order to ensure salt marsh habitat is not impacted. Two, coastal bank. The current plan shows the relocation of the existing garage from its current location within the buffer zone to a coastal bank to an area of upland outside conservation jurisdiction 
under CMR 10.30 section nine. Any project on such coastal bank or within 100 feet landward of the top of such coastal bank shall have no adverse effects on the stability of the coastal bank. Best management practices shall be employed in order to preserve the integrity of the bank during deconstruction. Three, limit, limit of work, LOW. An LOW must be depicted on the plan as staked straw bales with silk fence, the lower lip buried three to five inches to delineate the extent of disturbance and prevent any situation from entering the salt marsh. And four, stormwater. Do the proposal of the swimming pool, which is a new impervious structure within land subject to coastal storm flowage. The applicant must ensure that the new disturbed area within land subject to coastal storm flowage shall contain all stormwater. This may be accomplished by installing a dry well associated with the pool. From engineering, one, the application was reviewed to impacts on public rights of way and public utilities. This is a private way in this area. Two, any connections or alterations to public utilities would require permission from the appropriate town department. Three, the project must not direct any stormwater runoff to public property of butters or public rights of way. Four, we recommend that the board add a condition that requires the addition of dry wells, rain garden, or stormwater infiltration measure for the relocated garage. Five, up along road has been an issue for the Falmouth fire rescue due to far, how far back the lot sit, the lack of clear signage and questions on whether this is a road or not. As part of our efforts to improve addressing in the town of Falmouth to meet current 911 standards, the town will be working with the other residents of up along road for signage to their houses. It is not clear when this easement was named up along road, but it does not appear to be an official road. Land court plans show this as an easement. However, since this has been in use since at least 1974, which is the second published road directory, we have decided to allow the use of Upalong Road as addresses for parcels off this easement. The town will install a sign indicating this way as Upalong Road at the end of Bacon Farm Road. We request that the board add a condition to any approval that the applicant shall post the house number and arrow at the two forks of the shared drive as shown in the sketch. Currently, there are signs indicating brown without the number. 159 with an arrow should be posted similar to the posting for 165. Note that the number should also be posted on the house. We did not go further into the property to determine if this is posted or not. And they did attach samples to their referral. Planning board has no comments. Health department, there's no issues with the project as the in-ground pool is proposed to be 21 feet from the existing leach field when 20 feet is required. Assessor's department, no comment. Water department, the property is not on the public water system, so no water department comments. And fire department, no comment. All right, and for the applicant tonight is Mr. Bunker. All right. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the record. My name is Tom Bunker with BSS Design. Uh, we prepared these plans and let me share my screen so uh, we can show you. Uh, sure. Okay, do you see the screen? We can. We can, good, okay. Yep. Here's the, uh, this is the aerial photo of the area. See 159 up along road in, in this location here. And you can see, I didn't get the whole thing. You see it's, a, as mentioned in the engineering referrals, quite a long road uh, coming in from the off, off screen to the top and then down to this location uh, where there, there are two houses down here is 159 up along road. And this is the, the property that we're dealing with here, which runs from the water uh, all the way uh, to north of where it makes this bend. So this bend of the road is included on the property. Property line runs down the, basically the middle of the, uh, the road down to the water. And there is one other house down here. Otherwise it's the uh, property is surrounded by uh, town conservation land 
and then the, this other property over here. Um, our plan, it shows the road going through it. Uh, as I said, the property is obviously oriented differently from the aerial photo. You have to twist your head kind of, but the, uh, the some, of, some of the property is, the property is split by this roadway through here. And, uh, and zoom in a little bit. And so we see the existing garage is down in this location here. And uh, he proposes to move it uh, across this existing uh, grass area. Uh, it's already cleared. If you've been out there, you saw it from this across this existing grass area up to this location in the northeast corner of the uh, cleared area. And it's going to be put in uh, such a position that the existing uh, water well will be in the uh, basically the garage will be uh, placed, the foundation will be built around this existing well so that it's uh, so the well will be protected in, in, within the structure of the garage. And the garage uh, will really be used for uh, storage of boats and equipment. Um, there may be plans to do other, put in another garage back on here or something, uh, but there are no concrete plans yet. The uh, proposed swimming pool is in this location. Uh, and that is proposed to be uh, 16 by 32, the uh, size of the water next to the uh, garden area. And you can see that that location for the pool is 106 feet, uh, well exceeding the uh, uh, 50 foot requirement. And that's to the edge of the way, which, which runs with this, this, this dashed line along here. And it's uh, 127 feet from the property line, which is in the uh, center line of the way. And the pool is 525 feet from the edge of the road in this location. And the garage is 392 feet uh, from the uh, road to the uh, to the garage proposed location. Those are the, the uh, dimensions that we're talking about. We're in a front yard uh, on both sides. Uh, basically, every part of the property is um, within uh, within a front yard because the house is so tucked down in the corner here that it anything can't help but be uh, closer to the uh, road on one one side or the other. Uh, the Existing garage is 17.9 uh, feet tall in its present location, and it is uh, uh, scheduled to be put back at the same height above grade in this location. Uh, you can see it's flat. Uh, if you've been out there, you can see it's flat. I'll show you it's flat. Uh, here's the existing garage right here, two car garage. Uh, just go over the bushes at the water there, but if you're moving from that location uh, to, this is turning the other way, looking up. So this uh, plastic shelter is above the well right now. So that garage is going uh, in the location from, basically from this corner over to this stake is the length of the garage from here to here. And just barely into the, the edge of the shrubs that are at the edge of the clearing. The uh, stakes in the foreground, uh, four stakes for the pool, you can see flat. Um, on our plan, you can see that we have uh, changes recommended by engineering and conservation as far as drainage. Uh, but I was going <clears> to <throat> make the comment that uh, somebody a person couldn't get water to flow off the property, even if they tried to. It's so flat and so sandy that, uh, you know, from this uh, pool, uh, the rather the, uh, the the well here couldn't produce enough water, or heavy rainstorm couldn't produce enough water to flow off of the property. But as I said, uh, we've put dry wells around the garage. Uh, we put dry wells and a note saying that. Uh, Perimeter drains to dry wells or bio water runoff shall be contained uh, within the confines of the property and recharge the groundwater. So 
So we've done that, added the uh, drainage for the uh, pool and the, uh, the uh, garage. We have added a uh, limit of work. Uh, in this case, it has the symbol of staked straw bales, but we'll put in any type of uh, limit of work. Conservation feels necessary, but the uh, there's no excavation involved with this. There, there will be no bare dirt. The uh, or there, no, the truck is going to back in with some beams and all, lift the garage up, uh, and drive off with it and put it down here onto the foundation. So, uh, in the first pass, I didn't didn't think we would have to put up a limit of work, but uh, it's on there now. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Seems though the town has put up the sign that says up along road at the corner of uh, Bacon Farm. Probably helps some of you find your way out here. And there has been, uh, Mr. Brown did put up a, a sign uh, with the house number and his name out at uh, one of the forks in the road to uh, direct people down, down to this location. So I believe that uh, the uh, comments, the requested changes by the various uh, boards and departments uh, have been incorporated into this plan. You should be looking at the plan revised August 12th uh, for this site. And so this uh, will not increase, the, except for during construction a bit, will not increase traffic flow uh, there's no more burden on utilities or anything else. The site is suitable uh, for this uh, type of project. The uh, locations meet your criteria for accessory structures in the front yard uh, and for the height of accessory structures. And uh, I hope you can uh, approve this project. So I'll uh, take any questions and I will stop the share if, so if, if you want. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Bunker. Okay. And again, if there's any questions, comments, concerns regarding this project, go ahead and type into the webinar chat using your full name and address, and we will get to it shortly. Uh, as for board questions, Bob, do you have anything? Uh, just the only question is, is there any change of use in the garage or are you just using it as you're using it currently? No, right now, if you've been out there, you saw that the garage is basically for storage. It's, it's full and it's, that's how it's going to be when it gets moved, uh, but just for storage, pool equipment. He has, uh, you know, he's got a boat out there. It's no, no change in use. No, that's no habitation question. in it. Ken, anything? Yeah, so I think I read somewhere the slab is remaining uh, from the existing garage. Is that correct? Yes, what? that's correct because what's the uh, well, currently on, under conservation regulations, uh, <clears throat> say when that house was built and the garage was built, we put in a, uh, a lot of mitigation planting and that's based on how much, uh, let's call it impervious surface there is. If uh, he, he, Mr. Brown is considering uh, some future improvements to the site uh, and the, uh, coverage represented by that slab. Uh, if it were removed, then later on a garage put back or something else put back, then we'd have to do more mitigation planting. So that's that's really just a, a something to stay there to hold a place of coverage for uh, some future uh, project which hasn't been developed drawn yet. Okay. Uh, second question, kind of, are there any? Uh, Board of Health issues if your garage is has storage materials in it and it's also encompassing the well, um, you know, because if there was spillage uh, in the garage, you don't want to contaminate your well. Well, that's true. I I I don't know. I, uh, I can ask the Board of Health if they have any issues with that. Um, seen houses with wells in their basements uh, and I don't know if there are any special provisions. Uh, right, but, but people usually don't store, for example, fuel in their basements. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Uh, and then I, you mentioned the pool equipment. It, it, that's going to go in the, uh, in the, what is now the garage once it's moved out to the new location? Well, uh, by pool equipment, I meant whatever other things. I mean, it could be. 
Um, <clears throat> actually, I just got a text from the uh, from uh, Mr. Brown. He said that that's actually an irrigation well. Uh, ah, not a drinking well. Not a drinking well. Yeah. And as far as the pool equipment, uh, you know, I'm not sure. There's no shed here. Uh, uh, that's yeah. That's so that. So that's what I was wondering was where usually if there's a pool, there's some pumps and stuff associated with it, uh, where they were going to go. If he's watching, maybe he can chime in. He can uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe chime in there. I'll, I'll see if he, uh, I'll see if he says anything. Um, <clears throat> He says, uh, well, he says in front of pool, I think it'll be, uh, and, and if we have to uh, include, I, I'm not quite sure that this is part I didn't. Uh, he says yeah, pool yeah. equipment will be in, pool equipment will be in front of the pool, not in the garage. Okay, so usually, I mean, obviously it's up to him, but usually that stuff is enclosed in some kind of protective structure it could be right. a small shed or something like that but if so it ought to be included on the plan i guess well if you could uh see see a way to include the provision for up to uh, no more than 100 square foot shed for pool equipment or some type of enclosure yeah. as part of this uh just in case you know that was, he wants to do it and it was left off where you come back for administrative right. review to add a shed i think that's reasonable i mean there's plenty of space out there. So yes. there sure is. is. <laughs> We're at uh, one, you know, basically just 1% coverage. Yeah. Adding a shed is not gonna change that much. No. Okay, anything so those, else, are my, those are my questions, comments. Thank you, Ken. Mary, anything? James? No comment. Ed? Uh, the only comment I had was, where's the shed for the equipment? And they answered that. Other than that, there's nothing. It's pretty straightforward. All right. Thank you, Ed. Scott, anything? Hi, Tom. How are you? Hey, Scott. Hey, um, are there any restrictions that you know about? They plan on draining this pool year? I don't know about draining. I mean, we have a few small leaching, uh, leaching basins. Uh, if it was going to be drained, I don't know how many people uh, drain it. Actually, he just texted me. He said, no, 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 no draining. Drain it. I'm sorry. He says, no, not, not draining it. Okay. And, um, All right, so I see. I see the. Uh, I saw the um, irrigation well. Uh, where, where's the drinking water well in regard in relation to the um, the septic and and the pool? When we when we first did this plan, and I'm not sure if it's still there or not. I thought it was up uh, on the on the up by the house, closer to the property line by the house. I know that the well was there, and I think that's. Um, actually, I think there's a, uh, on the site plan, it might be the, the well, that's why I was con wasn't sure about it, up by the little parking area, up by the property line, uh, sort of the west property line, you know, in, just inland from the house. Can you, can you share the screen and just show that to me? I, I believe that's the area. Let me see, okay. Yeah, he says house well is close to house. Yeah, in the, in the corner, right in here. But that wasn't staked when we were out there, so we wouldn't have been able to see that, right? No, that's that's the existing well. I, I was, uh, this is the existing well in here. So I think we wouldn't have to stake the existing well. No, 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 okay. Well, you're right. Okay. Um, and th there's going to be power to this, right? You're going to run the power out of the house to this, or there's going to be a separate power line to it? I'm sure it'll be run as a, a feed from the house. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Scott. 
And uh, my only question about the project had to do uh, with the remaining slab, which Ken, are, you already addressed with Ken, Mr. Bunker. Yeah. So any other follow-up questions well, from the board? Noreen? So I, no, I think just following up on um, Scott's comment, I know that uh, it's typically a concern to the Conservation Commission that if you have a pool with fluorinated water, that when that water is discharged from the pool, it needs to typically have set for a particular period of time or something so that the chlorine doesn't impact the environment. Um, I don't know if they're planning to do that or a saltwater pool, but I think you know it's probably in perhaps everyone's best interest that there be I don't know, maybe some comment to that effect so that somebody, either this owner or future owner, doesn't inadvertently pump fluorinated water into the wetlands area? Could I, I mention that you just texted, it's a saltwater pool. Okay. All right, any other follow-up questions from the board? None here. I think we've heard everything that we need. anyone like to make a motion? Motion to close. Second. Second. All right, motion to close by Bob and seconded by Scott. Roll call vote, Bob. Robert Dugan, aye. Ken. Ken Foreman, aye. Ed. Ed Van Curen, aye. Scott. Scott Zielinski, aye. And TJ Harry, aye. How would the board like to proceed on the project? Motion to approve with conditions. All right. I'll second. It. Second. Give that to Scott. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Bob, you want to start us off with findings? Yeah, 240 uh, 68 a 240 216. Applicants moving an existing garage in a front yard to a different location and then constructing a saltwater pool in the front yard. All structures will conform to the 50 foot setback and are depicted on plans well beyond the 50 foot setback. The proposed lot coverage by structures is only 0.95%. Property is 5.7 acres. Um, garage will be used for storage. Any other also, findings? Uh, just the uh, property is a uh, single family use. And they're maintaining the former slab for the garage. All right. Conditions? Uh, per plans. Uh, conditions uh, for engineering uh, referral as well as conservation, which includes the dry wells. Um, on the pool, which are shown on the plan, and they already have the LOW on the plan. Mr. Chairman, I would certainly suggest that in the future, there'll be some kind of notification to future buyers and or in the event that they just, they change the, the use of the pool from a, a salt water to a, a, tr a more traditional pool that it be identified somewhere. So, and that inv um, the environmental people be no um, notified about it. Sure. Brad, did we indicate in the findings this is a salt water pool? Yes. Uh, we should also probably put in the findings that on the um, on the relocated garage, the uh, the well in the in the garage is for irrigation only. It's not a drinking well. We should probably also put in the findings that although this was not a um, defined road, the town is um, referring it now as a road off of an easement. All right, any other conditions? 
I think you're accepting the shed of up to 100 square feet in the proximate area of the pool. I think we are. Also, did we cite the addition of the uh, proper address sign as part of the decision? Yeah, we'll have we'll have them the conditions, all of the engineering referrals and all of conservation referrals as part of the conditions. All right, if that does it, that was a motion to approve with conditions by Bob and seconded by Scott. We'll do a roll call vote, Bob. Robert Dugan, I. Ken. Ken Foreman, I. Ed. Ed Van Curen, I. Scott. Bob Zielinski, I. And TJ Hurry, I. Project passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Bunker. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. And up next, we have application 39-20, Porter, Sama, 19, Clinton, Ave, and Falmouth. So application number 39-20. The list of butters, uh, I'm sorry, uh, being all persons deemed affected by the Board of Appeals under Section 11 of Chapter 40A of the Mass General Laws, you're hereby notified that David Porter and Catherine F. Samaha of Brookline, Mass, applied to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a special permit pursuant to Sections 240-3C and 240-69E of the Code of Falmouth to raise and reconstruct the detached garage adding living space above on subject property known as 19 Clinton Avenue, Falmouth, Mass. For referrals from engineering, one, this application was reviewed for impacts to public rights of way and public utilities. Clinton Avenue is a public right of way in this area. No alterations are proposed to the right of way. Any changes within the right of way would require filing a permit with the engineering division. Two, any connections or alterations to public utilities would require permission from appropriate town department. Three, the project must not direct any subject, any stormwater runoff to public property, abutters or public rights of way. And four, we recommend that the board add a condition that requires the addition of dry wells or stormwater infiltration measures for the new roof area at a minimum. Planning, no comment. Uh, regarding health, there was a uh, email from Attorney Clower uh, to Scott McGann. Uh, he said, Dear Scott, as a follow-up to our discussion regarding the proposed garage with living space above for 19 Clinton Avenue, attaches a copy of both the existing floor plan and proposed floor plan of the second floor of the main dwelling. This reflects the removal of a bedroom from the main house, so the addition of a living area above the garage will not be a violation of the variance issued by the Board of Health. Um, he just wanted them to, to agree, confirm that that was agreeable and he would provide a copy of the plans to the zoning board. Uh, Scott's response was that yes, the case opening to make a bedroom into an office where privacy has been eliminated would suffice to allow the space above the garage to be the new bedroom and the total bedroom count would still remain four. Uh, regarding wastewater. I didn't do anything. Uh, the 2017 Board of Health variance given for the septic system did limit the property to four bedrooms under Title V regulation. The proposed room above the garage was considered a bedroom, um, and the property was assessed as a four bedroom currently, and that goes to why they did that opening change for the modification. And there's a copy in the file of the variance for the septic. Um, there are some conditions regarding that variance. So maybe um, when Mr. Flower um, presents, he could just confirm that these were done. 
Condition one was the subsurface sewage disposal system shall be located and maintained in accordance with the proposed plan at the time of BSS design. That was July 19, 2016. Revised April 24, 2017. But the in final revisions, April 25, 2017. There shall be no modification to the existing four bedroom dwelling that could be adapted for use as an additional bedroom. And the owners of the property may not increase the total number of bedrooms on the entire property above four as a matter of right. Three, all shower and faucet fixtures in the facility shall be retrofitted with flow restricted devices. Four, the septic tank must be pumped at two year intervals. The homeowner must maintain records to establish that the system has been properly pumped at an interval of no less than every two years. Five, there should be no garbage grinder allowed. And uh, to be valid, the variance and conditions shall be reported, which they are. So Mr. Cloud can just confirm those other items. Uh, fire department, they don't have any issues with the project is drawn. A water department, plans indicate a, sep a separate structure with living quarters. A separate occupied structure requires a dedicated water service. Applicant must apply for a new water service at the DWP office at 416 Gifford Street. A plot plan showing proposed structures, location of new water service, and a 10 foot separation from all septic components is required to make the application. And that's all referrals on file. All right. And uh, if anyone has any public comment, question, or concern regarding the project, go ahead and type it in the webinar chat with your full name and address. Uh, we will address it when the time comes. Attorney Clower. Oh, you're on mute, Attorney Clower. Sorry, we, we all had a few weeks off. We're a little rusty. I'm, uh, I'm coming back from a few days of vacation, so I'm shaking off the rust as we speak. Uh, so, so bear with me. Um, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, my name is Kevin Clower. I'm an attorney with Ahmed Clower Law Firm here in Falmouth, and I represent the applicants, David and Catherine Porter the owners of 19 Clinton Avenue. They're here with us this evening. Uh, the Porters are seeking permission to raise and rebuild the existing non-conforming garage at 19 Clinton Avenue. This property is located close to the intersection of Clinton Avenue and Shore Street. It's on a lot of uh, 8,800 square feet, give or take, and it's located in a residential C zoning district. Presently, there's a four bedroom, single family dwelling with a large deck in the detached garage. The footprint uh, on, on the lot is 2,316 square feet. There's a number of existing non-conformities to the property. Uh, the dwelling is non-conforming to the front yard setback being uh, 18 feet where 25 is required. The garage is non-conforming to the rear yard setback being 1.3 feet where 10 feet is required. And the lot coverage by structured paving and parking is presently 26.1%, where 20% is allowed by right and up to 25% with a special permit. The applicants have owned this property for a few years and have recently made it their full-time residence. Uh, at the risk of oversharing, uh, this is a second marriage for both applicants. Uh, Mrs. Porter has three adult children with uh, spouses and grandkids, and Mr. Porter has four adult children in the same situation. The Brady Bunch has nothing on these people. So the issue is that we, they're looking to increase the, the habitable space. They want to increase the usefulness and the design of the property. Though the home is not classified as historic, the dwelling was built in 1890 and as such has smaller rooms and, and more of a closed off feel than you would see today. Uh, rather than trying to retrofit the existing space, they're looking to add useful space above the garage and improve the garage itself, which is presently undersized at 18 by 18. So they're proposing to raise and rebuild the existing garage and add living space above it. All, they will also be removing a large portion of the existing wood deck. Uh, though the garage will be expanded in size, the lot coverage by structures, paving, and parking will be reduced uh, due to the removal of the deck. The rear yard setback will be slightly improved to 1.5 feet. Uh, they're unable to move it any further away from the property line due to the setback to the septic system. And as was noted, uh, plans were submitted reflecting the elimination of a bedroom in the primary dwelling so that the bedroom count will remain four. 
uh, as was read in, this was presented to the health agent, Scott McGann. And he confirmed that the elimination of a bedroom with a cased opening would be sufficient to uh, stay in line with the, the existing Board of Health variants. Under Section 243C, non-conforming structures may be changed by a special permit, provided that they're not substantially more detrimental than what exists. It goes on to state that the board should consider the standards of 240-216 and also whether the alteration creates a new dimensional nonconformity, impairs views and vistas, and reasonably conforms to the average dimensions in the neighborhood. Here we have no new nonconformities being created. The existing rear yard setback is slightly improved from 1.3 to 1.5, and the lot coverage by structures paving and parking is also improved from 26.1 to 25.6. There's no significant impact of using vistas. Also in the residential C zoning district, lot coverage by structures, paving and parking uh, may exceed 20%, uh, but requires a special permit under section 240-69E. In that section, the board is asked to consider the size and height of the structure in relation to the average size and height of structures in the neighborhood, the effects of shadow on adjacent properties, the impacts on views and vistas from public ways and the effect of nitrogen on coastal embayments. We did submit a lot comparison worksheet showing 27 properties within a 300 foot radius of this, pro of this uh, particular parcel. Of those 27 properties, uh, 15 have a larger gross floor area and 13 have a larger footprint. This is by no means an outlier for uh, the neighborhood. There's no impact of views and vistas from public ways. There's no significant change uh, to the effect of shadow due to the location of the existing house. Uh, and there's no effect of nitrogen on coastal embayments as the same number of bedrooms exist uh, will exist on the property as at present. The applic applicant's proposal represents significant improvement over the existing conditions and the usefulness of the, the space, both in terms of the actual garage and the additional space above. It will not create any new dimensional nonconformities. It will improve to existing nonconformities and it meets the standards of 240-216. There are no adverse effects that overbalance the benefits that I've already outlined. For these reasons, I would ask that you grant the special permit and I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you, Attorney Clower. And once again, if there's any question, comment, concern regarding this project, type it into the webinar chat using your full name and address and we will get to it shortly. Uh, everyone's... Speaking of the Brady Bunch, everyone kind of repopulated themselves, at least on my screen. Uh, Ken, any questions? Are there uh, in the living space above garage, no cooking facilities of any kind or? That's correct. So right now it just looks like one giant open room. Yep, it's, it's really intended to be kind of overflow space uh, specifically for grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So they have a they have a place to play where it's it's not um, directly out of underfoot. everyone's hair. Not underfoot is how I'll put it. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, but I presume it's heated and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Mary. No comment. Thank you, Mary. Uh, James. No comments, but uh, Mr. Clower, I did get a haircut. Ed? No, no comments. Scott? Nope, you're, you're muted, Scott. Good evening. Um, are they still, still going to use the bottom part for uh, cars? Yes, it, it's going to be a functional two-car garage. And is there any, I didn't see anything in the plants for any additional venting or anything like that for carbon monoxide or there's no. I, you know, what we submit with, uh, with a, a special permit application are uh, floor plans uh, and elevations. The, 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 the actual structural building plans uh, tend to follow and that's submitted to the building department for application, but those aren't typically generated until after approval is uh, is obtained, but they'll have to submit plans reflecting all of that uh, at the time they submit for the building permit. Okay, and this will turn this into a four bedroom dwelling? It will remain a four bedroom dwelling as they'll be eliminating a, a, a bedroom in the existing, in the primary house. But still will add more, it will add more affluent to the system. So 
I know we can't count that as a bedroom, but there's clearly a bathroom up there. I just wanted that noted. Um, all right, that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Scott. Bob, any questions? Uh, just one, um, I guess one Brady Bunch question. So it's it's a four bedroom, remaining a four bedroom. So your occupancy allowed would be eight people? Uh, yes, I mean, that would be, that. that's a, that's a building code. Um, that's a Board of Health regulation. That would remain the same. So they understand then that if with a larger family or guest space that they wouldn't be able to have more than eight people occupying? I mean, it's it's limited by the number of bedrooms, and I think as a, as I mentioned, uh, it's really intended for overflow area. Um, a lot of the family lives fairly close by. Uh, but it's Boston. overflow, like like, but it would be overflow like recreation space, right? There would be no yes. additional people staying there. That's correct. That's all I have. All right, and Attorney Clower, what's the height of the existing garage and the proposed garage, please? I should have had that. Uh... Should have anticipated that question. So bear with me for one moment, please. No worries. The existing garage is uh, just over 13 feet, 13 feet, one and a half inches. And the proposed garage, I believe will be uh, 20, uh, 20 feet. All right. And the rear setback from that garage is improving from 1.3 to 1.5? Yes. All right. And are there any windows proposed on the rear of the structure? So I'd be, if would it be looking into? There are, I think there it are would two, be two fifty four. Sure. Sure. There are two windows in the rear of the structure, and I'll, I'll share my screen with you if you if you don't mind. Go right ahead. So bear with me here. So on the rear of the structure, you have two windows. This window here on the right-hand side that my mouse is over, that's a window at the top of the stairwell coming up from downstairs. And this window here is um, a window that's gonna be situated slightly higher as it's the window in the bathroom. Um, the, what it looks at at 254 is the uh, neighbor's garage, uh, detached garage. All right, and you may or may not know this. Do you know the, the closest side yard setback to 250, what 254's setback is? I from don't. That, from that same property line? No, I, I don't have that number. Okay. All right, that does it for me. And I'm not seeing any uh, public comment in the webinar chat. Does anyone from the board have a follow up question? Yes, yeah, so I just have a follow up question on the garage. I have so. one. Sure. It, it, uh, we'll have Bob go and then Ed. So, so Kevin, as far as the building department then is, they're not requiring a second means of egress here. They're only requiring the stairs internal. I mean, they're going to have to submit uh, a, a building permit application. So to the extent that there's any questions from the building department, those would come up at that point. We don't, the plans aren't vetted by the building department prior to submission, but the issuance of a special permit doesn't supersede the issuance of a building permit. So they'd still need to go through that process. And if there's any changes to the plans, we'd have to bring them back. Yeah, I'm only bringing that up because we've had this come in a couple of cases now where someone has come back because they've required the, so it just might be something you want to check on. My other question is above the garage, I know it has a bath. So there's another section there that has a sink. So they're adding a, a second sink area in there? There's, um, it, it's a, a wet bar effectively. Is there going to be a fridge or anything in there? Not to. <laughs> I, I I don't know the answer to that, but I I, I wouldn't be shocked. Um, it it would make a lot of sense to have a small fridge in there. But there's no cooking facilities. And have they complied with the other issues on the recorded variants in the septic system? Do they have the you know the water flow restrictors? Is all that in place? As far as I'm aware, um, it's it's not a question that I've presented to the applicants. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, I, you know, I have no reason to think that they didn't comply with what they were supposed to do. That's all I have. And Attorney Clara, would you, would your client be amenable to the uh, assessors reviewing prior to prior to sign off? I don't think that's an issue. All right. Any other? Oh, I'm sorry, Ed, you had a question, right? Uh, my question, my question was answered. It was the egress uh, for the second egress for the second floor. 
All right. Any other follow up questions from the board? Seeing none, if we have all the information we need, does anyone want to make a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close. Second. Motion to close by Ken and seconded by Ed. Roll call vote. Ken? Ken Foreman, aye. Ed? Ed Bank here and I. Scott? Scott Slisky, aye. Bob? Robert Dugan, aye. And TJ Hurry, aye. So the motion uh, passes and the hearing is closed. How would the board like to proceed? A motion to approve with conditions. All second. Right. Motion to approve with conditions made by Bob and seconded by Ken. Findings? 240-3C, uh, 240-69E, 240-216, properties residential C. It's a four bedroom dealt dwelling maintaining four because of a change to a cased opening um, in the main, in one of the rooms in the main home. Uh, the space above the garage is not really set as habitable space. There's no cooking facilities. There is a sink besides a full bath. Lot coverage is being slightly decreased uh, with structures from 26.1 to 25.8. Uh, it's being presented that the room above the garage is for recreational space only. That additional living area. Um, I think I'd also want to put in the findings that the applicant understands that at the four bedroom max, their occupancy limit for the home is eight persons. All right. Anything else for findings? Conditions? Uh, per plans, um, all the referrals from engineering and water um we do have to add to findings that there is a uh is a variance recorded at the registry for the health department for the four bedroom maximum all right i think the only issue i have in a condition and, and i defer to the board and how they may want to handle it you know we're seeing a lot of these properties with these rooms above the garage and you know first you have a bath and now you have a, a sink area and you may have a you know you may have a, a fridge or extended um i think it's important to condition it like you suggested mr chairman that the assessor's department go in prior to occupancy and confirm um the setup on the property but even though the, the health department has um have a variance on the septic I think we should also put in there that we're conditioning it on a max of a four bedroom. I think that's fair, Bob. And I think we should also put in there that there should be no variation to the plan. So they've opened that one room with the four foot cased opening um, and that's to remain open. Also condition no cooking facilities above the garage, property, single family use only. All right, any other conditions? All right, seeing none, that was a motion to approve with conditions made by Bob and second by, uh, we'll do a roll call vote again, Ken. Ken Foreman, I. Ed. Ed Van Kuren, and I. Scott. Scott Zelensky, I. Bob. Robert Dugan, I. And TJ Hurry, I. So the motion passes unanimously. Attorney Clara, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your time. Okay, up next we have application. 41-20 Fanning Trustees, 33 Chester Street in North Falmouth. So application number 41-20. 
being all persons deemed affected by the Board of Appeals under Section 11 of Chapter 40A of the Mass General Laws, you are hereby notified that Carolyn A. and Thomas C. Fanning, trustees of Needham Mass, have applied to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a special permit pursuant to Sections 240-3 and 240-16 of the Town of Falmouth to raise and reconstruct the pre-existing non-conforming single-family dwelling increasing lot coverage by structures on subject property known as 33 Chester Street, North Falmouth, Mass. For referrals um, from the Falmouth Historical Commission, at its hearing on July 7th, 2020, the Historical Commission voted to waive the demolition delay period for the demolition of the existing house at 33 Chester Street, North Falmouth, the commission felt the owner has done an admirable job of designing a house of proper scale and roof lines, window arrangements, a covered porch facing Chester Street, and other features that will fit well among the historic homes in the neighborhood. Um, from conservation, the proposed project appears to be outside of conservation jurisdiction, so the staff has no comments. From engineering, one, the applicant, the application that was reviewed for impacts to public rights of way and public utilities, Oliver Street and Chestnut Street, I and mean, Chester Street, are both public rights of way in this area. No alterations are proposed to the right of way. Any changes within the right of way would require filing a permit with engineering division. Two, the existing grass parking area does not conform to our current driveway standards. No apron opening wider than 24 feet. There are no proposed changes to the parking area. We defer to Zoning Board of Appeals if the parking area is required to be brought into compliance with current standards. Three, any connections or alterations to public utilities would require permission from the appropriate town departments. Four, the project must not direct any stormwater runoff to public property of butters or public rights of way. Five, we recommend that the board add a condition that requires the addition of dry wells or other stormwater infiltration me measures for the new roof area at a minimum. Six, we recommend the following condition be included in any approval. Upon completion of construction, the applicant shall post the address for this residence per section 99.1 for fixing of legible numbers required in time for compliance. Seven, where the site slopes down to the street, we request that erosion and sediment control are included for the project to protect the town's downstream stormwater system and public rights of way. Without a street opening a driveway permit, there is no mechanism for the DPW to enforce protection of the public right of way or stormwater structures within these ways. We recommend the plans be revised to include proposed erosion and sediment controls. If the plans are not revised for the special permit, we recommend the following condition be included in any approval. Construction of this project shall follow the attached soil erosion and sediment control standard conditions document. An erosion and sediment control plan shall be submitted for review prior to issuance of a building permit. References to the Department of Public Works Engineering Division shall be replaced with the Zoning Board of Appeals, who is the permitting authority for this project. There's an attachment of the soil erosion and sediment control standards and conditions. Water Department, current property has a one inch service connection. There are no water department issues that need to be addressed. Uh, historic, again, this went before the historical commission for a waiver of the one-year demolition. The waiver was granted on July 7th. Assessors have no comments. Fire department has no issues with the project as shown. And that's all the referrals. All right. And once again, if anyone out there has a question, comment, concern regarding this project, you can type it into the webinar chat using your full name and address, and we will address it when the time comes. And looking down there, I think that's the property owner, Tom Fanning. He's joining us via the webinar chat. And uh, Attorney Ahmed for the applicant. Thanks, Mr. Hurry. Good evening, um, board members. Um, for your record, for your global audience, I'm Bob Ament. I'm a Falmouth attorney and I represent the applicant, Tom Fanning, who's able to participate. He's the trustee of a family trust that owns the property at 33 Chester Street in North Falmouth. It's an historic area, though not a designated historic uh, district. 
this particular property is approximately across Chester Street from um, town property where the North Falmouth Public Library is located. Now, this proposal is brought under section 240-3 of the zoning bylaw um, and the comparable state statutes. Um, and it provides that a non-conforming structure can be altered or changed and included, including reconstructed, uh, provided the Board of Appeals finds that the um, proposed structure is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, the existing house was built um, um, around 1926. Uh, both the historical commission received and the Board of Appeals received an architect's um, report on a um, survey of the house, identifying um, many uh, deficiencies, code violations and uh, problems which to um, fix without rebuilding the house would be um, impossible. The house um, in summary has uh, reached the end of its, its life and uh, should be replaced. If you visited the property, some of the deficiencies are uh, readily apparent. Now, the existing house is non-conforming and that it's on a small lot, only just shy of 5,000 square feet. It's non-conforming as to uh, lot coverage because the structure covers 31.2% of the uh, small lot. It's non-conforming as to the setback from Oliver Street because the uh, house now extends to 15.4 feet from Oliver Street, which is a paved public road. And the house is also only about 11 feet from Chester Street, but we have cured that um, problem by having the building commissioner designate um, Oliver Street for the required first yard, and that allows a 10-foot um, setback to be maintained along Chester Street. Um, the house is also non-conforming with respect to its setback from uh, the, the southeasterly um, abutter, the Mara House at um, 29 Chester Street, where the um, an existing set of stairs um, and a landing are within the 10 foot setback and the house is right along the set that's 10 foot setback. So there are a number of non-conformances and the proposed house uh, will also uh, be non-conforming, but the uh, changes are um, clearly uh, not substantially more detrimental uh, to the neighborhood, um, as I will discuss. I do want to mention uh, that, uh, as I pointed out in a letter to the zoning administrator on August 7th, we have tried our best to um, submit plans and materials to the board that um, will uh, be considered uh, sufficient and comprehensive. And our hope is that the board is able to grant the requested special permit um, tonight. The uh, Fanning's hope to start as soon as possible. Um, and the goal is to close in the house before the weather uh, makes it more difficult to build um, this winter. So um, I hope we will prove to have been successful in, um, in that effort. The Fannings have gone to a tremendous effort to um, design a house that um, is clearly not more substantially detrimental, but in fact is a great improvement to the uh, neighborhood. And um, it appears that they've done so. The Historical Commission, um, as has just been read, uh, not only waived the uh, demolition delay period, but actually uh, went uh, out of their way to um, to write that the owners had done an admirable job in their uh, design and designing um, 
a properly scaled house with proper roof lines, window arrangements, a porch facing Chester Street and other features that fit in the neighborhood of other historic houses. And this is a case in which the Fannings have gone out to um, all their neighbors to discuss the plans and show them to it. And I don't recall another case in which every single interested person under the state statute has written a letter of support to the board. Every abutter, every abutter to an abutter, and every person directly across the street from the subject property. And there are many letters in addition to that from other people in the neighborhood. Um, so we have a neighborhood that is entirely in favor of the uh, um, the reconstruction of this house as um, as proposed, and that would seem to be very relevant in your determination as you um, consider the standard, which is whether or not the proposed reconstruction uh, subs is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming uh, structure. So the new structure. Um, would be set back um, a conforming distance from Chester Street. Um, the house itself would be set back 13.3 uh, feet from the southeasterly butter. That's an increase from the existing house. And it was done um, after discussions with the neighbor. The house was moved farther away just to give uh, the Mara family a bit more um, privacy. As you can see on the plans that you have, yeah, I should share this like so. I can do this right. So let's do that. If that helps. Um, the house is 13.3 feet from the Mara property. Now there is a stairwell um, that's uh, in this location that is uh, below grade. It leads to a small um, basement space for mechanicals and a little bit of storage because there's no other basement provided and there's no attic in this house. Um, and since retaining walls are not uh, defined as structures in uh, under the Falmouth zoning bylaw, uh, they only count as structures if they're actually in a historic district. Um, the stairway itself is actually 10 feet from the property line and probably therefore is conforming, but it's less in any case, if even if it's not conforming, it's less non-conforming than existing. From Oliver Street, the front yard setback is the same as exists uh, now, 15.4 on the uh, final plans, but that 15.4, as you can see, is actually to an open wood set of stairs that simply leads from the first floor level deck down to the ground level along Oliver Street. Um, by the, the Oliver Street angles away from Chester Street. And by the time the house is at the back corner here, it actually would meet the 25 foot setback a distance from Oliver Street. So the existing uh, house structure is 15.4 uh, feet away from this corner and then extends here. The house is only uh, 30 feet by 42 feet. It's not a big house. Um, there is this small two and a half foot L, this extension uh, right there in the kitchen of the, uh, the house. But I think it's important to recognize this is a small lot, but this is not a very um, big house and it conforms to the size typical size of houses in the neighborhood. Although this is an application under section 240-3, not the usual lot coverage case you see for somebody seeking um, lot coverage over 20%, but less than 25%. Um, I don't think that the kind of um, a study that, that compares uh, the bulk uh, and height of houses in the neighborhood would be required, but we submitted it anyway. And we identified the eight houses immediately uh, around this area, which, which would seem to be the neighborhood, and found that the average uh, lot coverage for those houses is actually 
um, a bit higher than the proposed in, uh, in this case. I think it was 32 point, about 85%. Um, and we're going from 31.2 to 32.1%. Um, but we're not increasing the, um, and decreasing the setbacks, at mainly because the existing house, which is shown over here, um, so portions of uh, uh, the, the lot that are not covered by structure but, but aren't any closer to neighbors would be filled in in the new house. And, and yet the increase is only 43 square feet, less than 1% of, of the lot. So it's, um, it certainly is not substantially more detrimental. The height of the proposed house is presently, well, the present existing house is conforming as to height, but the new house will be a foot and a half lower. We're going from 33 and a half feet of uh, building height to 32 feet in, um, in building height. Um, now, the DPW did make some comments and we responded to them uh, by uh, amending the plans to show dry wells as shown on this plan. The existing house has uh, gutters in disrepair but, uh, and downspouts, but there's uh, no infiltration into the ground. Um, and so all of the uh, roof surfaces in the new house um, will be connected to these dry wells in the um, runoff situation will be substantially improved. That's uh, uh, stated in a letter from the engineers for the project, the BSC group that was submitted to the Board of Appeals that there will be improvement um, in the uh, runoff situation. In addition, BSC, both in a letter, that letter and shown on the plan is providing a protection for the existing catch basin at the town really at the, the corner of Oliver Street and Preston Street. Um, the DPW raised the question about parking. And as I pointed out in my correspondence to the board of August 7, um, the zoning bylaw expressly provides that the parking requirements, which include a uh, requirement for two parking spaces, uh, per house um, do not apply to land uses uh, that existed in 1979. And of course, this house has existed since um, the 1920s. Uh, the land use is not changing. Actually, the existing house has five rooms that are used as bedrooms. The existing proposed house will only have four. Um, so there is no change in the required use. And historically over the years, um, cars have parked along Chester Street um, on the grass uh, to the west of the, of the dwelling. Um, the Fannings actually think that that's a whole lot nicer than uh, putting down paved surface. Um, the topography is gentle and um, is slightly um, away from the house. Um, so they don't anticipate, and hasn't been a drainage problem. Uh, the surface has worked um, and they would like to just uh, keep it that way. Um, so the DPW in their referral specifically said that they defer to the ZBA as to whether um, upgrading the parking, um, upgrading mean providing paved parking, um, spots or um, they could be gravel for the house, whether that should be required. And our zoning bylaw specifically says it is not required and the Fannings would prefer not to, um, not to change, the, change that. Um, now, I think that I've um, provided convincing argument that the increase in lot coverage of only 43 square feet. Um, so that this house can be 30 by 42. Um, and that there can be a 
porch facing Chester Street as uh, a historical commission felt was appropriate and um, um, makes it um, in its historic context more appropriate for the neighborhood. That that very slight increase um, is not substantially more detrimental. And that that is, um, uh, that the board can easily uh, make that finding and grant the special permit. What I do wanna tell you though, is that there was an error made in correspondence of mine to the board and I don't want that to go uncorrected. Um, in addition to explaining why um, this project should be approved under 240-3, which would have been required in any case, I noted in error that the zoning bylaw provides that where lot coverage exceeds 30%, um, then as of 1979, then an increase is allowed by right of up to 40% of the uh, remaining unbuilt area. And my error, which I actually did not realize until about five o'clock this afternoon in preparation for this hearing, was that that particular provision making the increase in lot coverage by right only applies to commercial properties. Um, so I have to strike that argument um, and simply rely on that fact that um, the increase proposed 43 square feet in the context of this application um, is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. That is the standard that in the finding that um, that you need to make. And um, Massachusetts cases, uh, including a recent case, um, make it clear that uh, upon a, an appropriate finding that um, the increase in the nonconformity will not sub would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, uh, the board can allow uh, such an increase and I urge you to do so. Um, I think I've covered everything I, um, I wanted to, and um, Mr. Fanning and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have. Very good. Thank you, uh, Attorney Amon. And once again, if there's any uh, questions, comments, or concerns out there, just use the webinar chat using your full name and address, and uh, we will get to it when the time comes. And I see that there's uh, one public comment already, so thank you for that. We'll get to it shortly. Uh, Mr. Dugan, is was there a Board of Health referral? Yeah, so I, I did miss the Board of Health referral, and it looks like when they uh, reviewed the property, when they reviewed it, the um, setback to the proposed foundation from the soil absorption system was not shown on the plan, so all their referral says is that 20 feet would be required. If I could um, add to the issues of the Health Department, we've actually had a fair amount of discussion um, with the health department and correspondence, Scott McGann has been very helpful. The, uh, a, a Title V septic system was installed in 2010. It's shown on the um, as-built plan to, for the existing conditions here. The same septic system will be used for the uh, new house and that had something to do with our design. The only uh, uh, change to the uh, septic system is that the uh, tank, which is right here, presently runs from, you know, uh, approximately west to east, is going to be rotated 90 degrees so that it, it goes um, north and south. Um, and um, by doing so, and by also limiting the basement to this small uh, 15 by 20 foot area, having the rest of the house on piles, we're able to use the existing septic system, even having structure in this area, which as you see in the previous plan, uh, allowed the septic system to go this way. By turning that, we're able to um, build the house as proposed. So of course the um, application can, um, um, require compliance with uh, uh, Title V, and any changes to the system would be um, uh, subject to a permit from the health department. So, Mr. Chairman, just for, for further information, so that is the only information that we have in the file from the health department. 
So even though we are getting testimony that there were discussions and whatever the changes were, we just don't have anything submitted to the file. So if any of that information is something, um, Mr. Ahmed should uh, submit it to the file so we'd have that on record. Because all we have to go by right now is that the health department is saying that they need a 20 foot setback. Well, we have an existing five bedroom house on the site using that septic system. Um, and we're changing it to a four bedroom house. And the Board of Appeals can certainly condition its um, decision on um, compliance with Title V. Um, I'll be happy to submit uh, emails, correspondence that I've had with uh, Mr. McGann. Um, but I think that the um, a condition which would, would be a condition regardless of the Board of Appeals decision about compliance with Title V um, will protect the public's interest very well. All right, we'll uh, turn it to board questions. Uh, we'll go the other way around. Scott, do you have any questions? Uh, sure. Uh, Attorney Ahmed, uh, when you look at the two, the two, uh, the proposed plan and the existing conditions, you can see why when that when that septic system got put in, it was a legal system because the distance between the corner of the, of the existing foundation travels under the existing porch. So that gives it its 20 foot off the foundation. I can't see anywhere on the new one where this septic system isn't out of compliance at every level. Yes, we agree with that. We've designed, for instance, in the rear of the uh, of the house, there is a set of steps and a uh, landing um, off of the back of the house onto a patio. And that is actually over um, a leaching area. Uh, yeah. But that is being, being suspended from the house. Um, and we've, that, design, that design is in keeping with the conversations uh, we've had with um, um, with uh, Scott McGann. So, so, uh, so we think that is the soil absorption system at its entire length will be less than or, or no greater than 20 feet or less than 20 because 20 feet is the reg to, to the edge of a foundation soil absorption system. I, that's the only foundation that that applies to is the uh, basement and the answer is yes. Uh, it will be uh, 20 feet from the foundation. Other than that, the house is on open pilings um, in order to be compliant with Title V. Okay. And, and are you um, familiar with whether that's an H system? There'll be no parking if that goes forward, right? On top of that system? Um, it's my understanding um, that the system uh, is designed to uh, allow parking over it, but that's something that Tom Fanning may want to wave in. Um, we regret that um, uh, Kieran Healy, the um, uh, of BSC Group, is unable to be with us uh, tonight. He had to um, be away on a family uh, obligation, um, and he might have some um, better answers. Um, Maybe well, he would be able to answer have... this next question. What would you got? What would your plan be for expansion in the event that this failed? Since this is ten years old already, where would you go with an expansion? Well, as is necessary in most of these cases involving smaller uh, lots, and would be the case with the existing system and the existing five-bedroom house you'd have to replace the system in the same location as the existing system. And sure, there's increasing, nothing unusual about that. It's, it's kind of, when you look over it at a single dimensionally, the old, the old version of the, the plot plan shows, shows the, uh, the porches. The new one doesn't. So you, you would actually have had more property with the old one than you will with the new one to be able to do expansion work, right? 
I don't think it'd be possible to expand the system uh, in in keeping with. You, you, there's no room for a reserve area on that plan. I don't think there is. But again, yes, I'm I'm just trying to find out the reasoning behind the not the not more uh, no more uh, detrimental when you have to change all the septic system around and there's no place to to. I just don't see where it all fits, Attorney Ahmed. Scott and Attorney Ahmed, uh, Mr. Fanning is indicating uh, that he has some answers for us. And if he's capable of being elevated, if he could join the conversation, uh, Tom Cox, could you try elevating him? Okay, Mr. Fanning, we currently elevated you and you would have to unmute yourself and able to be able to talk. All right, we have you on video and you just need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. No worries, Happy you can join us. Um, some good questions regarding the septic. It's a it's definitely one of the complicating challenges with this project. I think the piece that's important to understand is that the, with the notable exception of the small basement area, which is in the southeast corner of the plant, the area below the home is wide open. So there is no concrete diaphragm basement that you would traditionally see under a home. The structure is continuous footings with foundations that run perpendicular to the floor joists. This has been heavily discussed with, with, this, with our engineer and with the Board of Health. And the setbacks all comply. The basement has been reduced to a size that it's, it achieves the setback requested by the Board of Health. It is a complicated little site. That septic piece was quite confusing to sort out. I think it's important to let, I agree let you know you. also I that the uh, the veneer, the, um, you're not gonna see an open house underneath the house, much like other houses in the neighborhood, there will be um, um, a wood um, visual barrier that uh, will surround the house. Could I, Mr. Chairman, would it be all right if I just shared a foundation plan? It might help Mr. Zelinsky's question. I uh, don't understand. That's not, that's not my issue, sir. My issue is that on a leaching field that's going to encroach underneath an opening under a house causes more problems for me because if anybody understands how one of these works, it leaches five to eight feet out laterally and then percolates up through the ground. So that would be coming up under the house is, is my concern. And I'm trying to get to where, who, and if we had had a referral for this, it probably would have cleared it up for us especially me but yeah i think if if you if you'd allow me to show you the foundation plan you'd understand the rear of the home is cantilevered so the, the foundation line and the footing line is well back from the stone that surrounds the leaching field and the area below the home is open and free air with a notable exception of the basement and that that's how the board of health and the gentleman who stamped the plans to be in compliance with, with Title V got comfortable with it. We want for a clarification on that. So I guess if I could just chime in for a second. So I, I guess my biggest issue as far as we're dealing with the septic is I need to see something from the Board of Health. Oh, right, now, the, right now we can only go by what they, what they did and I'm sure you have had discussions with them, but They've left us with an open-ended question that said that 20 feet is required and they haven't chimed in further than that. So we may have to end up continuing this hearing anyways, but we would need something from the Board of Health that said they looked at the updated plan and that they're satisfied with the updated plan. Can't you or at make least, that or at least a liner or a variance for the short piece of that foundation that it's encroaching on? That you didn't even ask for a variance for that. We're not, we are... We had the plans reviewed by Scott McGann and of course by BSC group, which is uh, engineers, um, and designed the house to be uh, compliant with Title V, uh, Scott. 
Um, by by in essence, have deleting the basement. No objection to a requirement, uh, a condition of the approval that we get a permit um, or a letter of, of approval from the Board of Health or the health agent. That's perfectly reasonable. And that is that is the health agent's ballywick. Um, it is not really, um, I think, it should be the concern of the board to the extent it seems to be when the, the condition can be that the Board of Health or the health agent is satisfied with, uh, with that. And that would indicate that our representations are in fact uh, valid. You also have a stamp plan from the BSC group about this. Is it in our, is it in our, our concern to, um, you're requesting for, for uh, extended lot coverage. So all we're doing is reviewing it and trying to understand why everything has to fit in here. It's a tight site, Scott, no doubt coverage. about it. And the increase is, uh, like I said, 47 square feet. Um, it's not substantially more detrimental. And as long as we can meet Title V, and that certainly should be a, a requirement, it is a requirement whether stated or not, um, I think the Board of Appeals would be able to um, readily find that um, we meet the standard subject to that condition so that you can uh, comfortably approve this project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you, Scott. And where was I going? Everyone got rearranged again. I sh uh, shuffled everything. Well, you're right. Bob, anything? So I guess my only other question is we, I know it's a small improvement, but we, we are going above now that 30%. It was always my understanding that we didn't have the purview to raise the law coverage that high. Are you saying that we do, we can actually go over that 30%? Well, you're talking 30%. I'm not sure what you're referring to. The existing lot coverage is 31.2%. Um, the lot so, nor so normally, normally we're looking at projects and they're asking for, for permission to go up to 25%. I, that's of course correct. That's right. We have a special permit provision for that, and that is unrelated to uh, whether a house is existing, whether it's pre-existing, non-conforming, or or not. So, when a house is pre-existing and it's above that, in this case, you know, over that thirty mark, um, are you saying that we have the purview to increase that more? Yes, you absolutely do. Um, the as you know. Um, 240-3 uh, reads, says pre-existing non-conforming structures may be extended, altered, or changed, and that includes reconstructed, um, provided that they're not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or structure. That language was um, uh, recently uh, discussed um, it, by the appeals court in uh, this case, it's uh, Balada uh, versus Appeals Board of Brookline. It's a 2019 case, um, and it uh, holds specifically that uh, nonconformities, dimensional nonconformities, may be increased upon a finding that there's no substantial detriment to the neighborhood. Uh, that's a significant because the, um, in fact, it was an SJC decision, um, explicitly determined that structures need not obtain a variance um, as long as they get a section six finding, a finding that it's not substantially more um, detrimental. That was an interesting case and somewhat comparable to this because it had to do with a, a house um, in Brookline that did not meet the floor area ratio which requirement in Brookline, which was 1.0. Um, the existing uh, FAR in, in uh, the case was 1.14. And the um, Board of Appeals of Brookline granted a special permit to allow that to be increased um, 
to 1.38, a 0.24% increase, uh, an increase of about 20%. I mentioned that because we're talking about an increase from 31.2 to 32.1, an increase of, of far, far less than, than that. Um, some abutters appealed that decision and it uh, reached the SJC. And the SJC um, said that uh, upheld the Board of Appeals decision, their finding that it was not substantially more detrimental in the case. And the SJC said that under the language of the statute, which is uh, um, sometimes a little funny to deal with, but under the statute, um, that's all that was required. Determination that it was not substantially more detrimental. Um, so you can intensify an existing nonconformity the court even um, um, questions whether um, it didn't answer the question whether there can be new nonconformities, but that's not the case, wasn't the case there and isn't the case there. Interestingly, and some of you are probably aware of this, someone who's well known to some of you that is uh, attorney Kim Balin, um, who uh, was the chairman of the Falmouth Zoning Board of Appeals until uh, a couple of years ago. Um, who is a, a, a leading uh, zoning attorney, um, becoming more so in the state. She published an article um, about uh, this question. Um, and it'd be um, you know, very useful um, reading for you, uh, for you. There's Kim's picture in that article. Um, but uh, there is no question uh, that the Zoning Board of Appeals, if it finds that the change is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, um, has authority to um, increase the lot coverage. So in this case, it is almost de minimis, the increase that we're asking for, um, and it's accompanied by numerous improvements um, and, uh, and is supported 100% um, by the neighborhood. Thank you, Attorney Ahmed. And everyone keeps on getting rearranged here. Um, Ed, any questions? No, not at this time. Ken? No, I think they've done a good job of explaining the project. All right, did I miss anyone? Mary? No comment. Thank you, Mary. And James, anything? No comments. Thank you, James. And uh, we do have public comment. We have, I need to scroll up. Fred Monroe says he's a co-owner of 37 Chester Street. He has seen the plans and he supports the project. Thank you, Fred, for typing that into us. And I think that does it for public comment. Uh, any follow-up questions from the board? None here. All right. It's more uh, aesthetic than zoning question, but there's a lot of nice old plantings there. I think most of them are going to have to go when they <laughs> do the construction. Uh, any thought about re-landscaping? Yeah, you'll be happy to hear those are being transplanted to my wife's cousin um, as a part of the project. And we're, we intend to replant. I, we love those flowers that are along the base of the house. I was also I, thinking about, there's a pretty big cedar tree and a, and a, uh, a nice uh, roadie in the back there, I think, right? Yeah, next to the shower. The rhododendron, in the interest of full disclosure, unfortunately, is in the footprint of the future home. And I, I don't know whether we're going to be able to replant that or not. I, I'd like. It's a nice plant. It's quite mature. I'd love to move it if we could. Question will be, can we find a good spot for it? Uh, we just had another public comment come in. I just want to make sure we get to it. Uh, Trish Mara is in a butter at 29 Chester. She says that she's fully in favor of this new construction project that Tom and Carolyn are proposing and am in complete 
favor of the proposal to move their footprint a few more feet closer to Oliver Street, allowing space between our homes. Their proposed home is designed to scale and comforts to the character of the neighborhood. Thank you for your consideration. I did just have one more question. Um, when you're looking at the property from Chester Street on the right-hand side, there was a stake that was labeled retaining wall and I don't see retaining wall listed on the plan. Could you explain what that is? Sure, That uh, Bob, that's the area way for the stair to the basement. And it, it's, it's, you know, my thought process is it's three or four inches above grade. And then it obviously has a, a handrail so none of the kids fall into it. Okay, thank uh, that, that's what is referenced by that. And uh, Attorney Amman, I know a lot of the discussion tonight was about the, the Board of Health and, and the septic system, but I believe in your correspondence you touched upon the parking. I don't think you mentioned any of that tonight. And if you did, my apologies. I, I, I did, TJ. Um, I acknowledged that the parking does not conform to today's requirements, um, but noted that the DPW deferred on the question to the Zoning Board of Appeals to, under zoning. And I think they did so knowing that the zoning bylaw, I think it's section 240.105, expressly states that the parking requirements, which did not exist until 1979, do not apply to land uses and structures that are not changed so as to increase their parking needs. That, of course, is the case here. Um, we're not increasing or uh, changing the use. We're going from a five bedroom house that's existed since long, long before 1979 to a four bedroom house. Um, no. And the parking on the grass next to the street are, is consistent with uh, uh, other properties in the neighborhood, not all of which have garages. Um, and uh, is preferable to the fannings than having a more hard paved surface, which just increases the runoff onto Oliver Street and down to that catch basin at the corner. Um, so um, they're not showing new parking and they're not required to show it. And the failure to, to show that certainly can't be considered um, more detrimental than the existing condition. Um, and that's the standard uh, to be applied. Thank you for that clarification. All right, uh, any other questions from the board at this time? No, just more, uh, one more comment. I don't know how you clear this up, but so on the, on the assessor's record that's, that's in the file, they're actually assessing it as a four bedroom home. They're not assessing it as a five. So was the um, septic system designed for a five or was it designed for a four? It was designed, Bob, for a four. And I, it was managed by my father-in-law many years ago. I, I'm not exactly sure. I, I can, the existing conditions plan, which were filed with the historic uh, study, it's for, it is a five bedroom home. We, we don't need or want five bedrooms. And the system, it, to answer your specific question, was designed for four bedrooms. But I should also point out that a four bedroom system may be sufficient for a five bedroom house. Now, in this case, I believe that the existing house has eight rooms. Title V that says that once you have more than eight rooms, you no longer count the number of bedrooms, you count the number of rooms and you round down um, to the size of the septic system that's required. So if you have a nine room house, even if five or six of the rooms are used as bedrooms, you only need a four bedroom septic system. Count the number of rooms, divide in two and round down. Nine, bedroom, nine room house requires a four bedroom system. Um, so there's certainly nothing unusual about um, a house, particularly a seasonal uh, residence, um, 
that has more use. Um, and in, but in any case, we are reducing the number of bedrooms from uh, uh, five to four. Um, so that should be seen as an improvement. And we have no, would have no objection to a requirement that there are only four bedrooms uh, in the house. There is a room that's off of the kitchen. It has a cased opening. It leads to uh, the French doors in the rear of the house. That is uh, not intended and isn't designed as a bedroom. I think you can see that from um, the floor plans, which I can show you if you'd like. But the requirement would be that there only be uh, four bedrooms in the house. All right, any other questions from the board? Oh, we just went to screen share. Sorry, I, I was just throwing the plan <laughs> up, but that's at all helpful. Oh, God, it's rendering painfully slow. Sorry. Worries. that you putting the drawing on, Tom? Yeah, I think, Bob, when you were narrating it before, I, I don't think it was up, but I'm, I'm not totally confident of that. It wasn't up on my computer anyway. No, I didn't put that plan up, although I do uh, have it prepared to do so. Yeah, yeah. There's something you wanna show the board? No, I'm good if they're good. I, I, I was gonna try and quickly just throw up to show that the sun room's a case to opening, but I think everyone has the plans. I think they can sure. Yeah, we, we, have the, um, we have the physical plans in front of us, but thank you. Yeah. No All right. Um, has the board heard everything that we need? So Mr. Chairman, I, I just- am. I am, I'm all set. I, I just feel uncomfortable closing the file only because um, I don't know how the other members feel, but there's been a lot of discussion tonight regarding health and septic. Um, I feel very uncomfortable without having something directly from the health agent. We have no nothing in the file to go on. I completely understand what they're saying that their discussions were, but I have nothing to base that on that's actually in the file. And my other issue is, um, I'd like some more clarification on this being able to give a permit um, more non-conforming because it's going over that 30% ratio. I understand Mr. Ahmed said it's something that's in our purview. He's given us a, a, a case and um, also an article from Ms. Balin. Um, I would like to have town council weigh in on what that difference is. So I don't wanna close the hearing because I wanna be able to have submittals on that information. All right, Bob, well, I think that's fair. Can I comment, Mr. Hurry? Go ahead and turn it on. There is, of course, a cost to the bannings, a cost to the public in having the hearing be continued and taking the board's time um, again. The This is a case where we're going from um, either a five bedroom or four bedroom to a four bedroom house using an existing Title V septic system. And I understand, and as Mr. Zelinsky has pointed out, there's some questions about the changes that will be made in the design of the house to make sure it works. But that is entirely the purview of the Board of Health and the health agent. We can submit something to the board, but I would ask that if you feel you must have it in your file, and that simply referring to the Title V requirements and the requirement to get a permit from the health department, if you feel that's not sufficient, which it should be in my opinion, then um, simply make it a condition that we, that we provide something that becomes part of the Board of Appeals uh, decision that we provide a copy of the permit prior to the issuance of a building permit. But I think this is a case that you ought to uh, be able to close and vote on um, with that condition and you should be able to do so comfortably. And this is, uh, we are talking about an increase in lot coverage, which really is de minimis, um, which I, 
I have the information to provide to you. I also have the clear language of our bylaw. Is it or is it not substantially more detrimental? Is this extension of an existing nonconformance? That's the word from our bylaw. Um, if the answer is that the nonconforming nature is not changed, then it shouldn't even require a permit. That's what the case says. But if we are increasing the intensity, then the board must make the finding. Well, I appreciate you'd like to see the uh, case, um, but this is a situation where uh, the language of our bylaw refers to detriment to the neighborhood. There's no detriment to the neighborhood. The entire neighborhood is in, is in favor of this. And our hope is that this project can get underway um, without uh, further delay in taking up the town council's um, time. And so that in this particular case, where the request is so minimal, um, and despite the reservations that um, you have, Mr. Dugan, um, I hope you would find that you can vote um, to close the hearing and take a vote on, on this case. Thank you, Attorney Ammon. Um, how does the board feel about that? I, um, speaking personally, I think Bob is correct in this case. This is a very small increase from 31.2 to 32.1% lot coverage. It, he submitted information showing that there are lots of other houses in the neighborhood that are similar in size on similar lots. Um, you know, this is a historic area. And uh, historic commission thinks it's a good design. The neighbors think it's a good design. I just am not seeing a lot of concern about it. They've lowered the house slightly. They've reduced the bedroom count. Um, you know, they they've explained how they can meet the parking requirements under two forty one oh five. I don't see a problem. Thank you, Ken. And um, I, I won't call it de minimis, but it is a slight increase at half of a percent. And Ken, like you said, they they might be going up half a percent, but there were other concessions made to make it more conforming, the drop in uh, the bedroom count. Uh, I mean, overall, I'm in favor of the project, but I would I would like to see something from the Board of Health before we have we come to a conclusion here. But I wonder uh, if we couldn't reasonable. close. I, I wonder if we couldn't close the hearing except for written comment from the board of health you know in the matter of of allowing it to be slightly larger that i think is well established uh law uh we have the purview to do that for a pre-existing non-conforming use uh, ed or scott how do you feel you know i'd go for accepting it and put it, you know, get, get the information from Scott uh, again and have it put in the file. And I think it should be good to go. So you'd be in favor of closing tonight, Ed, or continuing for that information? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say close it. Just make sure we get the information before the file. All right. Scott, how do you feel? I think you know how I feel. I feel like a, a project that's of this magnitude and they're unwilling to come up with something that should have been in the file because they knew it was gonna be, there was gonna be questions about the septic. How, how can, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with what happens after we close this hearing and then the discussion, oh, he said, she said with, with Scott McGann, he's busy enough as it is. And I don't want this to get all sullied up. I, I think this is a big deal. I really do. And, and maybe that's just me, but I have a vote here too. I mean, there, 
If you want, if you want my honest opinion. Mr. Chairman, can I ask um, how we can expedite this? That is, if if the hearing were closed, um, but for the submission of uh, material from Scott McGann um, and continued for that purpose for a couple of weeks. Um, would that work? And in the meantime, uh, might the board instruct the zoning administrator to prepare a uh, positive decision subject to receipt of that so that the board uh, can vote it um, at its next meeting, if that's in two weeks. Um, I appreciate the concern. I think there are other ways to handle it and protect the public interest. Um, but um, I hope that the board could take an action that would expedite the um, where we're really trying to get to, and that is to get a decision filed, an appeal period running, and um, with the cooperation of the board and the zoning administrator, I think we can address uh, uh, the concern about the septic system without really causing delay. The problem is if we continue to another hearing, and then the board looks at the information and then takes a vote, that's what causes delay. But I think we can do this in a way that takes the least time of the board um, and um, helps out the owner. Well, Attorney Ammon, I, I do appreciate you being an advocate on behalf of your client, but when it, at, at the headcount that I have, I have three of us looking for a continuance and two of us would be in favor of closing. I mean, to close the hearing, that's to say that we have all the information necessary in, in order to render a decision when in fact that we don't. We have the three of us are concerned about the Board of Health weighing in. So when would the next I, possible here? When when could we? Get I think that? I think that warrants a continuation. Uh, and I'd, I'll defer to Noreen if if we could get that information and get get them on as soon as possible. Which it obviously is, won't take much time at a hearing if we get that. We could continue to September third is our next meeting. Right. right. That's and, very and reasonable. Just, Thank you, Attorney. I, I just think that it's probably in the board's best interest to not close the hearing because then you're limiting any questions or input that you may seek. I think it, you know, makes sense just for you to continue and then, um, you know, finish your discussion and vote. And I, I would like, Mr. Chairman, if at all possible, for something from town council on increasing the lot coverage, which does increase the nonconformity. You know, I'm not looking for something super detailed, but there shouldn't be too hard for them to just give us a general that yes, this is in your purview and this is what you look at. Everything that I've dealt with to date, it doesn't mean you can't. We've looked at a cap of 25% unless it pre-existed. And if it pre-existed, we've kept them at what their coverage was or they've reduced it. I just haven't seen one that's that's gone over and I understand what the other properties in the neighborhood are but I don't want to go in a situation where now we're doing a precedent on a project and now somebody else comes and wants the same thing so you know besides the information from the health department I would like to try to get something from town council and Mr. Ahmed could also submit the cases that he gave tonight he can send those over easy enough sure he can state them um I just feel uncomfortable without it just because I haven't dealt with that before I understand your uh, your concern, Bob. Absolutely, it, it's definitely the exception to the rule. It's certainly something that we don't see very often that we're actually asked to increase a nonconformity. But um, remember, in the past, that typically an applicant gives something up, like becomes more conforming with something else, whether it be law coverage or a side yard setback, and uh, you know they're only asking for half of a percent. So I'm to use one of Ken's phrases, I'm not getting too much heartburn over the situation, but uh, Attorney Amon, if you could definitely uh, submit that case law that you showed us tonight. And does, it, does everyone think it's necessary to reach out to town council? I just want to get anyone else's opinion. Ken, what do you think? I do not feel it's necessary. 
All right, uh, Ed or Scott, town yeah, council. I don't think opinion? it's necessary either. Right. I don't think it's necessary. Thank you, Ed. Scott, how do you feel? Uh, I'm not as concerned with the the slight uh, uh, increase in the lot coverage as I am with my other issues. All right, thank you. So, uh, Bob, I, I guess it's just the the case law and maybe uh, Kim Beelan's article as well. I'll get that to uh, Noreen tomorrow. Very good. Thank you. So I, I'm happy to make a motion then that we continue to September 3rd. Second. Okay, motion to continue to September 3rd. Uh, it was made by Ken and second by Ed. Roll call vote, Ken. Ken Foreman, I. Ed. Ed Vancouver and I. Scott. Scott Zelensky, I. Bob. Robert Dugan, I. And TJ Hurry, I. Attorney Amon and uh, Sorry, the Fannings, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, uh, all thank you, of you everybody. very much. Yep. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, so that does it for our public hearing items. Uh, moving on to open meeting, we have voting the minutes of July 9th and July 23rd. Uh, we'll take them one at a time. July 9th, has everyone had a chance to review them? Yes. All right, does so anyone want to make a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes for the, the 9th of uh, the 9th of August. I don't 9th have of July. Time. All right. In July. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. Motion was made by Ed and seconded by Scott. Roll call vote. Ken? Ken Foreman, I. Ed. Ed Van Curen, I. Scott. Scott Zelensky, I. Bob. Robert Dugan, I. Mary. Mary Gary, I. James. James Morside. And TJ Hurry, I. So those minutes are passed unanimously. Uh, July 23rd, 2020. Would anyone like to make, make a, motion? a motion to approve the minutes of July? 23rd, 2020. Second. All right, motion to approve the minutes for July 23rd, 2020, made by Ed and seconded by Bob. Roll call vote. Ken? Ken Foreman, I. Ed? Ed Van and I. Scott? Scott Zelensky, I. Bob? Robert Dugan, I. Mary? Mary Barry, I. James? James Morside. And TJ Hurry, I. So the minutes from July third pass. Uh, up next, we have a request for insubstantial change regarding comprehensive permit 6-19 for condition six of Locust Field LLC, Beach Plum Path, 430 Locust Field Road in Hatchville. Mr. Chairman, I've recused myself from this. Thank you, Scott. So Scott is recusing himself. And uh, just a bit of background, so those out there watching and everyone understands, uh, this is essentially an administrative request. Uh, it is not a public hearing, so no public comment will be taken for this. Uh, but the applicant is asking for an insubstantial change on condition number six of the comprehensive permit. Uh, if the board deems it insubstantial, uh, it will be approved essentially as an administrative request. It'll be amending the conditions or amending the comprehensive permit really. Uh, if the board finds the other way, if it is substantial uh, and the applicant wishes to proceed, uh, that would trigger a public hearing process hearing on the issue itself. And Noreen, I'm not sure if we, do we have anyone for the applicant tonight or? Yes, so Nick Marioni is um, in the attendees list. Very good. And uh, Tom Cox, if you could lift Mr. Maroney again for us, please. All right, so with uh, Scott Zielinski is recusing himself, we'll appoint, um, let's see, who do we have? Where is everyone? Mary, there you are. 
We'll appoint Mary to this as a member, voting member. And Mr. Maroney, if you want to present anything on why this should be considered in insubstantial change. T frozen on anyone else's screen? Yes. Yeah. All right, I guess we'll be standing by for Mr. Maroney. I, you have me now? We have you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think there's just a, a I, th I think that the way it's worded in paragraph six may have been a mistake. It's a little ambiguous to paragraph five, which states that the water line must be, the applicant shall install a water line shown the plans prior to a certificate of occupancy. And paragraph six states, that the water line construction should be accorded through town water department and just be tested prior to a building permit. So where we didn't have to even install it, it until prior to a certificate of occupancy, we think that that may be a mistake and we're trying to clear it up. And right now it's holding up six building permits. So what we would like to do is change the wording in paragraph six from prior to building permit to prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy. All right, uh, questions from the board, if anyone has anything at all? Not a question, just discussion, I guess. Sure. Anyone else have any, uh, any question for Mr. Maroney? Or is it just a matter of uh, board? I think he, I I would think that you'd want to get that water line in and get it tested to make sure that it has the right flow and all of that instead of wait till the job's all done and then do it. You know? Well, we, we, we got like, a problem. We're not going to know it until later. Well, water line is being installed now, but we, we also would like to be building the buildings while we're installing the water line. It's much like a septic system, you need it for a certificate of occupancy. You don't need water or sewerage to build a building. It actually gets connected afterwards. So, and, and I think on previous uh, permits that I've seen, that the requirement was prior to certificate of occupancy. You're right, we do want to get the line installed so that when the building is done, we're ready to connect and uh, get a certificate of occupancy. It's being done oh. simultaneously. Well, it's not just the water line, right? It, wouldn't it be fire hydrants as well? Yes, yes. That's correct. Fire hydrants, flow test, and pressure test. Test all be done chlorinated. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's all done by to the standards of the town of Falmouth Water Department, and it's being installed as we probably have half the line and now. The two hydrants for the project were audited, and they should be delivered next week. So, from a public well, from a public safety standpoint, wouldn't it make sense to have the water line installed with the fire hydrants and everything? If if there's going to be major construction no. on the site, no, we can't even pour a foundation at this point. But, but no, it's it's not. If the water line were installed, it still wouldn't be connected to the house. It, it, and, and it may not even be ready for, for flow test. But usually do that stuff simultaneously. But if the if the water line was installed and operable with the fire hydrants, I mean obviously not hooked up to a house because you don't have your building permits. I mean, from a public safety standpoint, wouldn't wouldn't that be make sense? Because God forbid, if anything happens while you're actually building. No, I, no. 
There's no one occupying the house. There is a fire hydrant at the beginning of the screen. Right. So, Mr. Ch so, Mr. Chairman, when we when we went over this decision, um, and the applicant had the decision, his counsel had the decision. They had the ability to review it. They had the ability to appeal if they found out there was any issues. I remember we had a very specific reason that we did this, and it also had to do with the looping of the water. We did think there was a safety concern. If you are doing a project, even if it's phased, you've got properties on both sides, you've got open area. Right now we're in drought conditions. Like you just said, what if the hydrants weren't functioning? They should be functioning during construction. I think what's happened in this case is that building permits were issued that weren't in compliance with the decision. Our last meeting, we did a insubstantial change because the plans of the buildings did not match the plans that the ZBA had approved. We were able to adjust those plans with sizes of the buildings and the decks so that the lot coverage remained the same. But it was another situation where, and I think Ken stated it last time, you start doing the work and then you ask for forgiveness after the fact. Um, I think it's very important that the water line and the flush tests and everything happen prior to construction. Um, I'm very surprised that that wasn't adhered to when this project started. It is in the recorded decision. It was never appealed. It was understood by anyone. I think they just bring it up now because they're now noticing after the other change that was wrong that we brought up, well, what about the water? That's supposed to be in prior to even giving you the building permits. So um, I don't feel this is an insubstantial change. I think this would be a substantial change. I think it's a safety issue, the safety issue for butters. It's a safety issue for the project. And um, I do not think a change like this should be allowed. I think that the water line should be in, the flush test should be done, the approval should be done the way it was, and then they could build, move forward on the building. At this point, I think the building department should put a hold on any of the permits that they've given out until this is done, because that's what they were supposed to do in the first place. Um, he did say that they're now putting the water lines in, so they should be able to move forward with, with doing the work. But that's something that was very specific. On top of it, this is a lip application. The town signed on, in on this. The town understood what our decision was. The town had any issue with that prior, they would have said, this is something that we aren't concerned about. But it was a safety issue. So I would, um, I would suggest that the members consider that and would consider this is not an insubstantial change, that the water line needs to be done with the testing as in the permit as it's stated now. And that if building is still commencing without that being done, that we ask that some kind of enforcement happen until that work is completed. All right. I agree. That's a thousand percent. Mary or Ken or even James? I think Bob said it perfectly. Hmm. I agree. All right. James, I know you're not a voting member on this, but. Okay. I agree Care to Bob. chime in? I All agree right. with Mr. Dugan. All right, Mr. Maroney, I don't know if you have anything else to add. <laughs> what do you say to that? Um, no, I heard you. All right, would anyone like to make a motion? Oh, Bob, if you're trying to make a motion, you're muted. So I, I would make a motion not to allow the insubstantial change as requested, that our current um, decision stands, and that we request enforcement to halt building until this condition has been met. Second. All right, motion was made by Bob and seconded by Ken. Do a roll call vote once again. Ken? Ken Foreman, I. Ed? Ed Van Cure and I. Mary? Mary Perry, I. Bob? Robert Dugan, I. And TJ Hurry, I. Uh, so that motion passes unanimously. Good night. Good night.
All right, up next we have the board discussion management of a butter participation for Zoom hearings. Anything? I don't think there's anything further on that. Um, I think we have found that even applicants are contacting the office to find out about participating with Zoom. So I would guess that there may be some issues with the larger public and their facility to participate in the Zoom hearings. I mean, I haven't had complaints from anyone saying that they can't get in. Um, but I, I think it's just something for the board to keep in mind, particularly with some of the uh, 40B hearings, for example, that you're going to have some difficulty with the butters, um, particularly people that may have some technological challenges. But I guess given COVID circumstances, we're all doing the best we can. Exactly. Yes, we are, Nari. <laughs> We did get a nice chat comment tonight on one project. So did so people Possible. are learning. They're they're logging on and chiming in. Uh, board updates. Uh, the bylaw committee that the um, the planning board has decided to postpone that uh, to next spring. I think it is. Yeah, so the town has suggested that if, if there's any current, you know, warrant articles to so the warrant that unless it's an extreme priority to hold them off to the spring. And even though the recodification, it's been going on now for three years. Um, there's no reason they can't wait, you know, can't wait to the spring. Uh, we're just getting the final comments back um, by the people running the project. Um, and I'm sure we'll go on that further another time. Um, I did have a, a procedural issue, and this is going to be regarding 40Bs in general. When we get into situations where we're having difficulty actually getting information or misinformation or something is actually holding up our ability to proceed to go proceed and discuss a project that's in it, in the way it is being applied for, um, I think at some point we need to notify the state agencies that have approved these. Um, my worry is that, that they're going to start blaming this as a, as a board issue. That these projects are taking too long. Um, they're lengthy. And even with Zoom, many people don't see that what we have to go through when we review these larger projects. Um, and I think it's important that the state understand that when we get some of these presentations, if we're not given the information that we need, it's very difficult for us to proceed. Um, many times in these applications with the state, they list, you know, design teams or you know who's going to be, you know, involved in the project. And many times we don't even see half of these people that are actually on the applications. I don't think the state's even aware of it. So if we get in these situations where we're having difficulties with some of these projects. I think we at least need to notify the state, you know, what's going on, you know, during the, you know, during the hearings and the application process. So they understand that what we're looking for is specifics. And if we're not given the specifics that we have, it's very hard for us to, to proceed forward. I, I just don't want the board to get flack because these projects will take a long time. I mean, we've had a lot of issues in the past where we've asked for things, they just don't come in. Um, you have situations where you're looking for professionals that are licensed to do specific parts of a project, and yet we don't get to see them or get any feedback from them. Um, and I think it's, it would also be important that um, the town management knows, um, you know, inform some kind of a basic on some of these projects that this is the problems that we're having. Um, I know that we've seen some stuff recently with situations where our actual decisions just aren't being followed when they start going out to these other departments. Um, and if there's a specific procedure that has to happen to make sure that that goes forward, town management and the board of selectmen have got to step in here at some point. Um, right. You know, it shouldn't be our job all the time to watchdog everything and then get the runaround. So at some point there has to be a meeting between these departments and management 
Um, and I know TJ that you've, you know, you've chimed in on this with, with management, but um, we need to get some kind of a response to that. We can't keep going in circles um, on situations with permits. When, when these hearings go forward, abutters rely on what our decisions are. And it's very hard if, when you're on the, you know, on the other side of everything and a project goes up you know, near somebody and now you see issues with it, it's very hard to get enforcement. It's very hard to put complaints in. Um, the town seems to look at it as if, well, now it's your job to go out. It's your job to get appeal. It's your job to hire an attorney. And I just don't see why that should be put on a butters all the time if the issues that are occurring and causing this are happening within the town, within the system, the town should at some point correct that so it doesn't put these additional burdens on everyone. And I don't know if that means we have to write something in as a board or who we have to write with, or if the board has to request a meeting with the selectmen or a meeting with the town manager's office, Zoom or not, but we're gonna have to do it at some point. We just can't keep putting it off. All right, Bob. And that's an excellent segue to what I was uh, about to say. Uh, based upon the board's conversation during our last meeting, um, I decided it was appropriate to, to voice our concerns. And I put together an email. I sent it to the town manager, the assistant town manager, uh, the chair of the select board, and I cc Noreen and Ashley as well. Uh, basically addressing the concerns of the post permitting process that we've been seeing and Bob that you just touched upon. Uh, and the town manager has forwarded that email along to the building commissioner along with town council, uh, hoping to, uh, well, hoping to put together something. And Noreen, I don't know if you've had any contact uh, regarding any of that at all. I have not, but I would think it might be a value for there to be potentially a conversation, even if it is just a board member or two with perhaps the building commissioner and you know perhaps the town manager or another individual just to get a dialogue going. Because I think, you know, perhaps there's not sufficient feedback in exactly what the ongoing issues are and i think that it would be helpful perhaps to you know at least have some sort of you know q a or something where you can get some issues on the table and resolved and you know certainly it does not need to involve the entire board but i think it's probably there's been enough issues going on that you probably should seek some type of resolution with that. As far as the 40B applications go, what I would recommend to the board is that when you have a circumstance where you're expecting um, a developer or whoever's giving the presentation to give you new material and they don't present material to you, you know, you typically are capped at the 180 days within which to hold a hearing. That being said, you are allowed to extend that where a developer doesn't provide for you the information you've requested. So it's pretty important to make sure that that becomes part of your record, that you document that. But I think the other part of the problem is that, you know, 180 days is a long period of time. And to have uh, that extended because people are not timely providing information for you. Uh, is pretty frustrating as well. Um, I don't think the state can help with that. I think they're too far removed from what's going on to have that be something that's on their radar. Uh, but certainly it's something that the board can discuss with an applicant. It might help to tighten up our board rules so that they're a little bit more expressive with a 40B on what's expected from them and that they be a little bit more conscious about their uh, presentations and their timelines. That 180 day extension, Noreen, does that have to be agreed to by the applicant or can the board decide so, that on our own? Right. So the 180 days is what the state law provides for you. Where you're under COVID guidelines now, those 180 days are not hard and fast anymore as they realize that boards are working under unusual circumstances. 
So those timelines, as I said, are, are not hard and fast at this point in time. That being said, you know, it's, I think, sort of a waste of the board's time where you're putting aside time on a hearing to have forward progress on a particular application. And if, for example, you'd only scheduled one hearing for tonight and that was rescheduled, you know, you'd have your night free, but you would have put aside the time for that where you weren't actually using the time. Noreen, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree, though, that in some instances, that anybody that's been around this for a while, they use it, offenders use it as a strategy to, to, to stretch it out and, and, and make it convoluted so the hard and fast decisions or, or findings become not as important and, and, oh, I forgot that or I did this. By stretching it out, and nobody holding anyone's feet to the fire for any of it. What's the penalty for it? It's, it's been allowed to continue for as long as I can remember, and it's not getting any better, and yeah. I can't do anything about it, and it makes this board look like, you, you, the, you know, the executioner because we're asking questions, and nobody else is doing anything about it. That's why it continues to happen. I mean, I'll say it out loud. Yeah. No, agreed. It is frustrating, particularly where the basics of what you're expecting in a presentation is the same for every 40B. And, you know, when people aren't following through or providing uh, the proper professionals to you to make inquiries of or get answers from, but what it, message is it sending to the public? What, what service are we really providing if what we do as public servants isn't being enforced? It, it's very frustrating. You know, when you when these projects apply yeah, to the state, of that. you know, when these when these projects apply to the state and they have to list the qualifications of their team that's presenting. So, you know, they'll have a, an attorney for representation. They may have a consultant. They'll have an engineer. Don't they expect that when they apply to a town, those are the people you're going to be hearing from? I mean, we've got cases where people are listed in the application and you never even hear from them. And the people that probably have the qualifications, the ones you want to hear from, are specifically staying out of the picture. And there, there, there's just no way to get to that. I mean, the state must at some point say that they're approving these applications based on the, the status that they're given of the professionals. And they assume that that's who we're getting the presentations from. And I guess that's what's really frustrating. You know, I read through those applications and I, all these applications on 40Bs, there are multitudes of errors in the applications. I, I mean, anybody reading through the application should be able to pull dozens of issues out of the applications. No one's called to task on it. And then when we need to get information from specific people, and when you get it, is when they appeal. And suddenly somebody appeals, and suddenly that team that was given to the state jumps in and you've never seen them before. And I think that's what's really frustrating to people is that, you know, you're, you're looking at a project and you're relying on those people to give you the information that they need. And they specifically stay away from it because you get presentations that are so convoluted that you get one week, you get somebody saying one thing and the next week they come in on the same aspect and say something completely opposite. And then the third week when you thought you were past it, you're back to week one because somebody has changed all the information again. And I don't know how the state expects the board to review that kind of information, but we don't have anything hard line to, to go on. Yeah, I think that you have a relatively unusual circumstance here where uh, in my past experience, there most times was an attorney, typically an attorney who specialized in 40Bs, who was essentially giving the presentation to the board and you know, representing the uh, developer at the meetings. Um, 
there's not a specific requirement for that. But I think the problem is, is that if you have someone who is making representations to the board, and if they don't have the complete information, it does leave a lot of gaps. I personally would be against meeting with any of the uh, authorities in a private setting. I would certainly want to have uh, some kind of record of any kind of conversation I had with any of them. Probably wouldn't work out good for me. I mean, honestly, on some of these, if, if we do these, you know, these board site visits again, I completely agree because there is no record of what's being said at those visits. And then when we ask questions regarding a visit and what we heard is different, there needs to be something, whether it's a recording or something, because it's the same situation you have where, you know, it's great when a developer has these neighborhood meetings, but a lot of times there's these neighborhood meetings and then you come to a hearing and half the neighborhood doesn't come to the hearing. You think, oh, well, that's just kind of unusual. Maybe they're all happy. And then an applicant will discuss all the things that they fixed at the neighborhood hearing. Well, we don't know what happened at the neighborhood hearing. I mean, they could tell one person one thing and now they're in front of the board, nobody shows up. So it's the same situation there. We, we need to get information. And on a site visit, I would, I'm telling you, I, I won't go to another site visit without somebody taking the record down. Not after this past one. I just, I won't do it again. It's, it's too risky. Noreen, was, was, was the site visit uh, advertised as a, as a meeting? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, though, here's the thing is that you're not legally required to notice a site visit. That being said, we do post it, uh, providing a minimum of two day notice in compliance with open meeting. Okay. Yeah, because we were always, you know, very cautious before about gathering the entire board together for any site visits and also you know, certainly information collection, but no discussion of our views with the applicant. Uh, during Correct, the so the intent is that you can go, um, you can see the site, you can ask questions, but they expect that there be no deliberation or communication right. amongst the board members. And I, I completely agree with that and I understand. My situation is if you're at a site visit, and somebody, the development makes a statement. And then down the road, you have a hearing and that same subject comes up and they state something completely different. And you'll say, that's not what I heard last time. And the first thing that they say is, well, I don't remember it that way.
getting any backup from our administration. Did you get anything? I will look for those. Yeah, I mean, Sari might know where they are. I, okay. Uh, there were things that, you know, just would come up in a hearing where the definition of something was either not included in the bylaw and should have been, or yep. ambiguous or something. Some very clear, you know, they were simple, but necessary fixes. Yep, and I, I think it's convenient having planning essentially right next door where if something comes up, I typically call the planner and right. let them know my what I'm thinking about. Uh, right. But you know, will you really discover the holes in these bylaws? Because I've been on both the planning and zoning board. So at the best of intentions, you, you come up with language in the bylaw and then in the but, zoning know, context, you'd say, you discover all the loopholes because sure. yep. someone clever comes in and says, ah, but it says this. Well, and I think the other part too is that where a lot of communities don't like to spend a lot of time on their bylaws, hence this long recodification that you've launched into, you know, the bylaw really needs to be more of a living document where like you point out, if you find that there's an error or a loophole that you can, uh, submit that to be changed and that that's something that regularly goes before town meeting as opposed to once every million years. Right. All right. Anything else for board updates? I don't think so. You guys had enough for tonight. <laughs> I have a personal update. I asked a big question on Tuesday night, and she said yes, and I am engaged. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Feels awfully weird announcing it via Zoom during a meeting, but, you know, that's COVID for you. I would have done it over um, drinks afterwards. Yeah, that would have been good. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's she's very gonna, exciting. She's going to kill me. It's part of the record now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Any future agenda items? All right, seeing none, Lance. our next meeting is September 3rd. Good night, okay, everyone. We'll see you then. Good night. Good night, guys. Good night.